Hey guys welcome back to the channel this is a story about what if Deku became a vigilante part 1. If you guys enjoy this what if and want to see part 2 comment down below and let me know before I start please do support for more awesome content. And leave a like and don't forget to subscribe to my channel and also share this video with friends and check out the description in my playlist so let's start the video. Mom, one day I'm going to have a super awesome power like All Might, right? The young Midoriya looked up at his mother both of them watching the All Might Rescue video for about the millionth time. She looked down and gave him the warmest smile, put her hand on his head and gently stroked his curly hair. Of course, she started to say, holding her son tightly, you're going to be the greatest hero who ever lived. Izuku turned from his mother and looked back at the screen, not wanting to look away any longer than he had to. He had an All Might action figure in each hand, and moments like these filled his heart with hope and light for the future. It's a shame it didn't last. Sorry kid, it's not gonna happen. This was the first thing that had ever been burned into Izuku's memory. Sorry kid, it's not gonna happen. The way the doctor said it was so plain, so matter of fact, so simple, yet the effects the words had were anything but. Izuku couldn't move, he could barely breathe. The room around him got blurry, and the sound of the doctor's office was replaced with the pounding of static. Izuku looked around the room, at his mother. Tears began to form in his eyes as he felt his body grow stiff. Every fiber in his being had given up. And at age 5, this was a lot to process. When Izuku got home that day he sank into the sofa and just stared off into the distance. His mother looked at him with a deep concern. Izuku, please honey, say something. She sat down next to him and put her hand on his head, running it through his curly hair. Izuku's head slowly turned to look at his mom, tears rolling down his face. He opened his mouth to say something but nothing came out, just whimpers and moans of sorrow. He quickly leaned into his mother, holding her tighter than he'd ever held someone. It was a good few minutes until the words finally reached Izuku's mouth. M. Mom can. Can I ever be a hero? The words dripped from his mouth like the last few drops of rain after a storm. There was a stark silence before his mother said anything. And for Izuku, this felt like forever. Son, I, I don't know. She said, holding him tighter. The rainstorm that was Izuku's mind didn't clear, but it stopped raining. The clouds just stayed there, motionless. The landscape was covered in darkness, and Izuku didn't know the next time the sun would shine. I wish she had said nothing, it might not have affected me as much. Izuku stayed home for the next few days, his mother telling preschool that he was sick, and for all intents and purposes, he was. Izuku's mother had a child psychologist stop by, taking a look at him. She didn't know what exactly they talked about, but the doctor came out and looked at the mother, his face in a frown. Midoriya Sen, I'm sorry, he's not doing the best right now. After hearing this, tears rolled down her face, she didn't want to think about what is going through Izuku's head right now. It's not often that a child's dream is crushed so thoroughly, but don't look so down. After talking with him, I think your son should make a full recovery. He might go through life with a different attitude, but right now are some of the most important times in determining the personality of someone. If you show him the right support and nudge him, I'm sure he will turn out an amazing person, quirk or not. She nodded her head slowly after hearing this. Just make sure that both his life at home and at school is good. I'm sure he'll turn out fine. My school life being fine. Fat chance. Later that month Izuku was at school hanging out with Bakugu and his friends. He had a strong admiration for Bakugu and his quirk. Explosions could be used to fill the world with such good. He kept rattling off all of the uses for it in his head. Destroying rubble, deflecting attacks, propulsion, shooting projectiles, and so many combat purposes. He would often ask his blonde-haired friend about what he envisioned using his quirk for. Silly Deku, I would use it to beat the villains to a pulp. That was Bakugu's usual answer. However, answers like that always made Izuku pause for thought, even at his young age. There was so much more one could use that quirk for. In fact when they were both around the age of seven, Izuku wrote a five-page pamphlet about all the uses and applications he could think of for Bakugu. It contained detailed strategies and situational applications. It even outlined possible flaws of his quirk. While Bakugu was reading it his expression was one of happiness until he reached that last section. This was the first time that Izuku did anything but praise his friend. Bakugu's face turned sour, and what could be considered a sneer started to go across his face. This was also around the same point that it was revealed that Izuku was quirkless, and for the most part no one really brought it up. Well, until now. Listen here, Deku. Bakugu spat out, each word carrying with it the same power as one of his smaller explosions. I do not have any weaknesses. Bakugu reached out and grabbed the poor Izuku by the collar of his shirt, pushing him back until he was pressed against the wall. I am sorry, Kakin. Do not call me by that weak-ass name anymore. 
Bakugu's face looked intense as he said this. Sure, Bakugu had a short fuse, but this was nothing that Izuku or anyone else had really seen before. I will not allow Quirkless Squirt Deku to call me, someone who will one day be the number one hero, anything less than the best. Bakugu's grip tightened around Izuku's shirt. It was that day that Izuku learned that Bakugu sweats more when he's angry. Drips and drops of sweat fell from his fist and landed on Izuku's chest. He whimpered and winced in pain as tiny blasts went off on his skin. Kak, Katsuki-chan, let go please. You're hurting me, Izuku managed to say, finally getting over his nerves. What happened next was the second thing that was burned into Izuku's memory. That smile, that rotten smile. Bakugu looked happy that he was doing this. Izuku was an eye level to him, and his expression sent a bolt of fear throughout his body. He dropped the boy soon after though, it was time for class to resume. Bakugu looked back at Izuku with a glare, and Izuku found himself flinching. Bakugu smiled before turning away. That marked the change in Kaken, or Katsuki-sama as he forced me to call him. When Izuku was 14 and finishing up middle school, he and Bakugu's relationship was strained to the point of snapping. Bakugu would call Izuku Deku most of the time but when he was particularly upset he would call him Quirkless or Squirt. Unfortunately for Izuku, they both were in the same class all the way to the end of middle school. It seemed that every year Bakugu got more and more fierce in his bullying while also becoming more and more bold in his claims of heroism. I'm going to be the one to surpass All Might. Bakugu would shout. He was surrounded by his friends and Izuku. They would all shout in agreement to his claim, but Izuku would just look at him. Why yes, I'm sure you will Katsuki-sama. Izuku would finally say after Bakugu glared at him enough. Bakugu would smirk at the poor boy before reaching out and aggressively ruffling his hair. This once peaceful and calming act became one of malice and pain for Izuku. Good squirt, if you're lucky one day I might let you be my tactician. After all, that's all a quirkless is good for, helping those who have power. The only time that Izuku had any freedom from this while at school was during classes. He and Bakugu had far apart seats, and he enjoyed it to its fullest. Bakugu would still try to distract him during class, but Izuku simply got better at focusing on the lesson. He poured his heart into each subject. Even through his bullying he got top marks in each class, but something was still strange. None of the teachers ever seemed to acknowledge his accomplishments. When announcing that someone got top marks they would simply skip Izuku, and when he brought this to the principal they shrugged it off, saying that it was simply Izuku blowing things out of proportion. For Izuku this was another way that life was against him. That reality was unfair simply because he was in the 20%. Well, not every teacher was bad. There was one that seemed to be on his side. Kadachi sensei was, in many ways, his only friend that he had at school. He taught biology, and it quickly became Izuku's favorite subject. Kadachi always made a point to state that Izuku got top marks were applicable, in addition to everyone else who did. For the first time in his life, Izuku found someone who treated him fairly, who didn't punish him for being quirkless, nor did he baby him for it either. Izuku and Kadachi had many talks with each other. Izuku loved spending time in his office before and after school. It was a peaceful place away from Bakugu, and Kadachi could see it in Izuku's eyes that he needed the company. I'm sorry for spending so much time in your office, Kadachi-sensei. After Izuku said this Kadachi looked up from his workbooks and gave the student a warm smile. Don't think anything of it, Midoriya-kun. It is my duty as a teacher to protect my students. You almost sound like a pro hero talking like that. Izuku's voice had a fondness in it, a great admiration for his teacher. There are other types of heroes other than pro heroes Midoriya-kun. Kadachi began, setting down his workbooks as he felt a conversation arising. A hero is someone who fights for what they believe in for the good of the society. Izuku thought for a moment, before coming to a realization. What Kadachi-sensei, don't villains do that as well? There are tons of villains who fight for what they believe in. Kadachi nodded his head at that remark. Yes, but the main difference is who is going with the status quo versus who is going against it. That is how society determines who is a hero and who isn't. A look of concern crossed Izuku's face. So it doesn't matter how bad a person is as long as they are on the right side of the status quo. Izuku had put down his notebook and stood up. Kadachi thought for a moment before looking at his pupil and shook his head. I'm afraid so. This is how it has been and how it will be unfortunately. Many people have tried to change it, but none have succeeded. Izuku looked down at his hands. They were holding each other and wiggling around. He felt antsy and noticed a tickle in his throat. Sensei, is, is there any hope for someone like me? Izuku's voice was cracking, and he was visibly shaking. Kadachi stood up and moved around his desk until he was standing next to the young Midori. Listen to me, Midori Akan. This world is unfair and harsh and cruel. This world needs those to fight the cruelty and the harshness. Only someone who has lived and survived through it can truly fight it though. He put a hand on Izuku's shoulder. I believe in you, Midori Akan. You might not have a quirk, but you have so much potential. You see this world differently from others, and that is both a curse and a blessing. 
Because you don't have a quirk, you might feel weak, but there are so many ways you're strong. Fight it, Midoriya Kun. Fight the demons inside of you who want to drag you down into despair. Fight that feeling of hopelessness, but most of all I want you to promise me something. Izuku looked up at his teacher, his eyes welling with tears. W what is it, sensei? He could barely make out, his voice broken. Promise me that I can look up the name Midoriya Izuku and see a long list of accomplishments, and someone who is fighting for the rights of everyone. Izuku nodded his head slowly, trying to not look like a complete mess. Let me hear you, Kadachi shouted, gripping their shoulders tighter. I promise, sensei, I will do it, Izuku shouted back. There was still sorrow in his eyes but it quickly became overwhelmed by joy and motivation. It felt good to have someone believe in me, but it feels like even that is against the status quo. Bakugu saw Izuku leave Kadacha's office with tears and a smile on his face, and something fell off. Izuku looked overjoyed, and this pissed him off. He slammed his hand on the wall and decided to wait. He would let Izuku enjoy this high, at least until lunch. When it finally came time for lunch Izuku intended to sit down alone. Some days he actually had the luxury of doing so, but today was most definitely not one of those days. Bakugu and the rest of his gang all set their trays down. Izuku was surrounded, and worst of all, Bakugu was right next to him. He tried to not look at any of them, opting to stuff his face and look down at his food. At first, through some miracle, he thought his plan was working until he heard Bakugu's familiar voice. Quirkless, you should look at your superiors when they sit down with you. His words erupted from his mouth, each of them was dripping with contempt. Izuku slowly lifted up his head, his mouth still full of food. He looked around, still trying to not make eye contact with Bakugu. He felt a hand on his head as it was forcibly turned. Over here, quirkless, his eyes came face to face with the blondes. Izuku felt his muscles tense and his nerves scream. Bakugu scowled at him. Thank us for gracing you with our presence. Izuku was scared of what would happen to him and quickly blurted out what Bakugu wanted to hear. Thank you for being here, Katsuki-sama. Unfortunately for the young Midoriya, his mouth was still full of food. A few pieces flew out from his mouth and landed squarely on Bakugu's face. Izuku's face turned white as Bakugu's face turned red. He could feel the boy's anger start to burn, and if looks could kill Izuku would be several feet deep. Before Izuku could react, a sudden strike hit his stomach. He didn't look but knew it was Bakugu's fist. Bakugu turned Izuku's head so when he retched the food that was in his mouth landed on his plate. Apologize, Deku. The words traveled through the air like lightning. Izuku tried to flinch, but Bakugu's grip on his head was only getting tighter. I'm sorry, Katsuki-sama, Izuku said, his eyes welling with tears. He bowed his head slightly. You can muster more feeling than that, squirt. The hand holding Izuku's head started to sweat, and his eyes grew wide. He knew what could happen if he didn't give Bakugu what he wanted. I'm sorry, Katsuki-sama, he said louder, his body starting to shake. You are nothing, you hear me? Bakugu's iron grip somehow got tighter. You are quirkless and worthless, and will never amount to anything. I bet your dad somehow knew you were quirkless, and that's why he left. That was the third thing burned into his memory. He had no way of proving the validity of Bakugu's statement, but in a way that made it worse. Before he could even start crying, the bully continued. I bet your mom wishes you were less pathetic. Imagine how long she had to put up with your quirkless bullshit. That was the fourth thing burned into his memory. I, I, no, she cares for me Beck Izuku tried to say, to counter what was being told to him to try and remind himself that this was Bakugu trying to push him to the edge. If you go home and ask her about this, of course she'll say it's wrong. She's been lying to herself and you for years, so why stop? Izuku could feel his head heating up, pleasantly at first before it started to burn. A bunch of tiny explosions all going off on his scalp. Slight trickles of blood oozed down his head. You're you're hurting me. Izuku moaned, his voice barely a whisper. Good. Quirkless people like you deserve nothing. You exist to make those who are better than you have easier lives. Bakugu growled, his words came down like a chisel on soft stone, etching their meaning on the surface. That's, that's not true, Izuku muttered, but barely a sound came out through his tears. What's that quirkless? I can't hear you at all. Bakugu finally let go of Izuku's hat. Go run off and cry to Kadachi sensei I can't believe you made him your babysitter. Izuku tried to get up, to run, to leave, but his body didn't listen. He wanted to say something, to fight back, to push this all off. Izuku started to rock back and forth slowly. He was searching his mind for something, anything, that could calm him down. His breathing grew more rapid and uncontrolled. His head turned upwards, eyes darting around the room. He saw people and faces, but no friends, no allies. He thought about running to Kadachi or home. He thought about everything he could do in this situation. The world around him started to spin. He felt dizzy even though he hadn't moved an inch. Slowly Izuku stood up, his muscles creaking and his body rigid. He got up from the table and started to walk, just anywhere. 
He could hear laughter, joy, and merriment from Bakugu and his friends. Izuku collapsed, landing with his knees on the ground, trying to keep himself supported with his arms. He could feel a hand on his shoulder. He looked up and saw a blurred face of a teacher. His ears were ringing so loudly that he had no idea what the teacher said. Then he felt more hands on his back. They yanked him up, moving him onto his feet. The hands seemed to drag him, pulling him somewhere. He could hear more talking, but the words are so far beyond what he could reason right now. He could feel his body ascending, moving through the school. Everything felt both too slow and too fast. His body felt hot and cold. He was shivering but sweating. After what seemed like eternity he finally reached where he was being taken. The roof. The hands let go of him and he fell to the floor again. He spun himself around, looking up at the blue sky. Breathing in and out, Izuku managed to regain some composure. The fresh air and calming sky helped him greatly. He wondered why he was brought here and who brought him here. He sat up, slowly, his body still not entirely sure if it wanted to move yet. His heart just about stopped. The next few minutes were the fifth and final thing burned into his memory. Bakugu was standing on the roof with him, only several feet away from him. He was hoping Bakugu would apologize, to make right what had happened, but for Izuku, no such luck existed. Ask yourself this, the bully began, a scowl on his face, should someone as worthless as you exist. That was all Bakugu said, leaving Izuku on the roof. There was a loud slam as the door closed behind him. This is it. Izuku's thoughts ran through his life up to this moment. He stood up and walked over to the edge, peering over the side. Here I am, alone, as I usually am. The wind blew through the air. The young Midoriya shuddered at the wind's cold edge. Should someone as worthless as me exist? Bakugu's question ran through his mind repeatedly. His mind flickered through the people who would miss him. Kadachi, his mother, and... Was that it? Was that the extent of the impact he'd had? No, I can't be that lonely. Izuku put a hand to his head. At this point the blood had dried. He started scratching at it, picking at it more and more. I can't be that lonely, that small. I had to have caused some change. He continued to scratch, soon breaking through the dried blood and then skin. As he looked out over the edge of the building, the bright sky above him and the busy world beneath, he felt nothing. No fear, no anger, no happiness, no joy. The numbness flooded his body, and he felt nothing as he took a step up to the ledge. Am I worthless right now? The boy's arms fell limp to his sides. Blood covered his right hand, but he didn't care. Why should he? I am. He thought to himself, those two words all the encouragement he needed to take one more step. I am, he repeated to himself again, but this time he noticed he left space for a word. Why would he though? Unless, I believe in you, Midoriya Kun. The voice of Kadachi rang in his head. Izuku's eyes grew wide, the memory of their conversation flooding back to him as if to help fight what he's going through. Do I deserve anything? A hero is someone who fights for what they believe in for the good of the society. It was like Kadachi was standing behind him, but these words weren't coming from the area around him. They came from somewhere more important, deeper. Am I worthless? Because you don't have a quirk you might feel weak, but there are so many ways you're strong. I fight it, Midoriya Kun, fight the demons inside of you who want to drag you down into despair. Am, promise me that I can look up the name Midoriya Izuku and see a long list of accomplishments, and someone who is fighting for the rights of everyone. Izuku grabbed the door handle and threw it open. He was rushing down the stairs back into the school. His footsteps echoed in the empty halls. Everyone was still at lunch. Once he reached the second floor he made his way to Kadacha's office, knocking rapidly on the door. Who is it? Izuku smiled at the voice of his teacher before sliding open the door. Kadachi sensei I need to tell you some Izuku began before being interrupted by Kadacha's eyes widen and him shouting. What happened to your head, Midoriya? The teacher seemed startled, dropping the fork he was holding, and it landed in a bowl on his desk. Izuku looked up not really expecting to see anything, to try and remember what the teacher could be talking about. What are you, though, sorry about that, sensei? I think that Katsuki-chan might have caused that to me but it's no big deal. Izuku blurted, the words running out of his mouth in a long string. It doesn't really hurt, well, anymore. Izuku moved a hand and scratched the back of his head while nervously giggling. Kadachi shook his head and stood up. You need to go to the nurse, Midoriya-kun, that's not a small amount of blood. And wait, did you say that Bakugu-kun caused that? The young Midoriya's face lost some of its expression. Well, sorta. He began, his voice was a bit distant. Katsuki-chan has been bullying me for a while now, sensei, and today I've had enough of it. Izuku looked up at his teacher, a fire now lit in his eyes. Sensei, do you know anywhere I can find books on heroes and villains throughout history? Kadachi looked intrigued by Izuku's question. Why would you want books like that? I want to study the past and present. I'll need both if I want to fix the future, sensei. At this point, Kadachi had to brace himself on his desk to handle the sheer amount of energy leaking from Izuku. You want to get into politics? At this question Izuku had to think for a moment. Well, I could, but I feel like there could be better ways to reach my goal. 
Izuku could have sworn he quickly saw a smile flash on Kadacha's face. A more direct way. He began. A fast way to change society. There are only so many ways one can go about doing that, Midori Akun. I don't care. I've had enough of this life, of being a worthless quirkless person. If I want to be someone of value, to change how people like me are valued, I am willing to do anything it takes sensei. Kadachi smiled, for real this time. Go to the nurse, Midori Akun, and then I want to see you after school. Meet me in my office. Kadachi sat back down at his desk. Run along now. If you're lucky you'll leave the nurse's office before class starts. Izuku nodded his head, before turning to run down the hall. He wasn't quite sure why or what his teacher was going to talk to him about, but he felt like it was something special or important. Several minutes had passed after the school's final bell when Kadachi heard a knock on his door. Come in, he said. Writing some notes for himself in relation to his classes, he looked up and smiled. Ah, Midoriya-kun, close the door behind you please. His eyes traveled up to the top of Izuku's head, which was wrapped in bandages, before returning to his notes, for a minute. Then he put them away and took out a small box from under his desk. What did you want to talk to me about, Kadachi-sensei? Izuku questioned. He had spent the past few hours trying to figure out what the teacher had wanted from him. Kadachi smiled and opened the box, unfolding it into a chessboard. The pieces had fallen out and Kadachi picked them up and carefully put them on the board in the right place. He moved the board so that it was in between and equidistant from the two people. You're white, so go first, Kadachi stated, motioning for Izuku to make his move. Izuku looked at his teacher before looking down at the board. Did you want to just play chess with me, sensei? Izuku asked, trying his best to not sound confused or frustrated. Kadachi shook his head. No, I want to teach you, and this is a good way to start. Kadachi motioned towards Izuku again. Take your move. Izuku was still confused, but he shrugged it off and reached for the pieces on the board. He knew how to play chess and played it some when he was younger, but he hadn't touched it in years. He grabbed a knight and moved it out in front of his pawns. The piece felt smooth in his hands. The chess set was a nice wooden one. It seemed to be travel-sized as the pieces could easily fit in the box and the entire thing was smaller than a normal set. Less than 10 seconds had passed from Izuku letting go of the piece before Kadachi quickly grabbed one of his and moved it. By the time Izuku blinked Kadachi's hand was already motioning for him to take his next move. Izuku just nodded and thought for a moment, moving one of his pawns forward. This back and forth continued for a few minutes, before the silence was broken by Kadachi. Tell me Izuku, what is the most important piece on the board? The teacher asked, in a tone not unlike one he uses in class. Um, um Izuku looks at all of the pieces on the board, going through them all in his head. Well, I think the answer is the king. Kadachi paused in the middle of moving his piece. Why do you say that, Midoriya Kun? There was a gentle tap as Kadachi put his piece down. But before he could motion for Izuku's turn the boy had already picked up a piece and moved it as well. Because the king is the piece that decides who wins. Kadachi looked at the state of the board. He thought a few possible moves ahead and found that despite Izuku's inexperience, his student had put him in a difficult position. You're half right, Kadachi said while trying to figure out how to shift the balance of the game back to his side. The king is the most important piece, but not your king. It is your opponent's king that is the most important. A look of realization crossed the young Midoriya's face. Of course, Izuku looked down at the board, at the captured pieces, and the two kings. It doesn't matter how few pieces you have at the end. It doesn't matter how many losses you've taken. All that matters is taking down the enemy's king. Izuku sounded excited. But on that same hand, the one thing you are trying to take down is my king. Izuku picked up his king and brought it to his face, at eye level. But a king can't do it alone. Izuku set the king back down on the board. A king cannot capture a king. They will always need help. The boy looked up at his teacher. Am I the king? He asked, wondering if that was the point of this lesson. As a response Kadachi shook his head. No, no offense to you, but you are not vital enough to be the king. He reached out an arm and put it on the boy's shoulder. The idea is the king. Your idea to be specific. Your idea for a better future. That is the king. Kadachi looked at the boy in front of him. His medium-length curly green hair, some of which was bandaged. His freckled face, but his eyes lingered most on the boy's eyes. They looked sleepless, hollow. This boy had been through hell, and it hurt Kadachi the most to know that there is still more hell to go through. Izuku was in the middle of reaching for a piece when Kadachi interrupted him with a question. Midoriya Kun, do you consider me a hero? The boy thought for a moment, recalling his past encounters. Why do you ask, Kadachi-sensei? The teacher shook his head. I asked you a question first. Kadachi looked like he needed an answer. Izuku didn't know why his teacher wanted to know, so he decided to just tell the truth. You've saved me from myself and the world around me several times, sensei. Izuku picked up a piece and moved it, looking up at his teacher. I believe you're a good person, and I do consider you a hero. Izuku was smiling. It felt good to say he knew a hero. But I still want to know, why do you ask, sensei? 
Kadacha's face lit up into a smile at Izuku's answer before dimming somewhat to the question. Tell me something, Midoriya-kun, do you know of an old vigilante who went by forecast? Izuku sat back and thought for a moment, searching his list of people he's looked up information about. I think I might. Izuku began, stating everything he remembered. Code name, forecast. Real name, Kumo Shizuka. Quirk, silver lining. Quirk description. The ability to manipulate and control clouds. The amount that a cloud can be controlled is directly proportional to the amount of clouds within a radius around Kumo. Manipulation included the ability to move clouds, to change the current downfall provided that the temperature was correct, and to alter the cloud's refractive index to turn it into either a mirror or telescope-like apparatus. Other functions have been theorized, but not proven. History, forecast, Aka, Kumo Shizuka, was a vigilante type hero who worked not with any agency or under anyone's commission. He specialized in information reconnaissance and retrieval. Most of his work was sneaking into villain hideouts, stealing their plans or information, and leaving without anyone knowing he was there. There were also several reports, although none proven, of him doing this to pro heroes as well. What ultimately caused his downfall was he leaked information concerning a major villain ring and the villains found out his identity. The villains then leaked it to the public stating that if he did not publicly execute himself, they would attack his family. In response, Forecast killed himself to save his family. His body is currently buried at a cemetery for heroes. Was that correct, Sensei? Izuku asked, after having just rattled off all of that information in one go. Kadachi looked shocked speechless for a few seconds, before managing to regain his composure. I am surprised that someone of your age still cares about what happened 20 years ago. Izuku shrugged, finally having a chance to move the chess piece. I've looked up a lot of different heroes and villains alike. Izuku let out a nervous chuckle, realizing that he'd never really told anyone that before. It's my hobby. Izuku looked up at his teacher, and he could tell that they were deep in thought. Sensei, he asked, finally breaking the silence. What are you thinking about? When asked this, Kadachi shakes his head, finally being snapped out of whatever he was thinking about it. Oh, Midoriya-kun, sorry. I was just thinking about. Huh, Kadachi started, before trailing off into silence again. This time he turned and looked out his office's window. How do you plan on fighting the status quo? Izuku tilted his head, a bit confused by why his teacher was asking the question and why he was acting so odd. Though, uh, hmm. Izuku thought for a moment, then a moment more. He had an answer to the question. As a matter of fact he had two answers. One that he felt would be effective, and the other was the more realistic answer. I want to go into politics, Izuku said, trying to feign a sense of excitement about the concept. Kadacha's face turned to a frown. Midoriya-kun, I have known you for many years now, and I can tell when you're trying to not give me the answer you believe in. Kadachi leaned forward, getting closer to Izuku. Please, Midoriya-kun, tell me. I want to hear the truth. I won't judge you or anything. Please, as your sensei I want to hear it. Izuku gulped loudly before smiling. It was a nervous and awkward smile. Well, sensei, you see. Izuku gulped again. He could feel his heart beating in his chest. I want. I want to be. His ears started to ring again, the world starting to fray. He didn't expect his teacher to ask this, and he didn't want anyone to hear the answer. He wished he was at home, and could work on this without needing anyone to know. Izuku swallowed one more time, but this time he steeled his nerves and said it. I want to be a villain. He shouted quickly, getting the words out of his mouth before his brain could fully analyze them. Though, Kadachi replied, getting up and walking over to the young Midoriya. I might want more of an explanation. A week had passed since Izuku had talked to Kadachi about being a villain. He sat in his room, a small desk lamp illuminating his workspace. He looked down at the papers and books before him. The Complete History of Quirks, Vol. 1, A Guide to Combat, 3rd Edition, and I'm on Fire. Lessons on how to be a hero. Not to mention countless papers and articles written by heroes and villains throughout the ages. I want you to read these. It's a lot, but I know you can do it, Midoriya-kun. Kadacha's voice rang in his head again. He took a sip from his glass of water before his eyes wandered out the window. It was currently 11 p.m., and he should be getting to bed soon. However, Kadachi had given him extra assignments, with the sole purpose of pushing him towards his goal. Izuku rubbed his eyes, not expecting it to be this much. There was one more book on the table, currently left untouched. Chess, the Game of Kings. Izuku felt a shudder go down his spine whenever he looked at it. That book was a tome, a monolith, and it had nearly everything one needed to know about chess. Kadachi had given him the book to work on his mental aptitudes as well. Thankfully he had given him a month to finish it. Izuku let out a sigh. The school year was slowly approaching its end. He only had around four more months. Kadachi had sworn that he would get him into some semblance of competency by school's end. Izuku closed his eyes, allowing his mind to wander. He needed a break from this, even if it was only ten minutes or so. Don't say you want to be a villain, Midoriya-kun. You will not become one. 
But sensei, I, I feel like that's the only way to get what I want. Listen to me. A villain is someone who was hurt in his fighting society. While it is true that you have been hurt, I don't imagine that you want to fight society. Well, I mean, what you want is to change society. Which means you need to change the minds of the people. Fighting someone isn't a good way to change their mind, unless you want to rule with fear. There is a quote, it is better to be feared than loved. How does that help me, sensei? I thought that you said, there is more to the quote than that, Midoriya kun. It is better to be feared than loved, if one cannot be both. Tell me, Midoriya Izuku, which would you rather be? Someone who is known for their cruelty, their viciousness, and their hatred. Or someone who is known for their love, their passion, and their dedication. I, I want to be known for the second. I want to be remembered as a hero. And what do you call someone who does something heroic? Who at the time is marked as someone who is not a hero? A vigilante, sensei. Izuku shook his head and looked at the clock. A full 20 minutes had passed. He must have fallen asleep for a moment there. His eyes moved back to the books and he resumed his reading. I will fix this world. He muttered to himself, determined to not let his work overwhelm him. What he wanted most was to bring change and he would stop at nothing to do so. He glanced at the chess book again. Maybe a few things might delay him though. Izuku and Kadachi had started sparring together after school ever since they talked. Izuku was getting quite good at it in the short time they'd been doing it. However, when Izuku reached the abandoned warehouse that they'd been meeting at to train, he saw something that definitely wasn't there before. There was a table in the center of an open area, with a large chess board on it. Welcome, Midoriya-kun, to your first day of more intensive training. Kadachi was standing next to the board, smiling. Izuku looked between his teacher and the board, questions forming in his mind. Today, I am going to train something that is essential to your goal. Kadachi pressed his finger on the chess board, and after a moment Izuku heard a beep. This is an automatic chess board. It even moves the pieces on its own and everything. Today, I want you to play it. Izuku nodded his head, approaching the board. I thought we were here for combat training, sensei. I thought we played chess during our non-combat meetings. Or do you need a break? Izuku asked, looking over the board. It was much thicker than the other boards they've used. There were also these lines that ran in between every square of the board. And the pieces, upon picking one up to look at it, had magnets under them. I can assure you I'm not growing tired. Kadachi pressed some more buttons that laid on the edge of the chess board. You're going to have a five-minute clock per move. This, five minutes, sensei. We've gotten down to 30-second clocks. Why would I need a five-minute one? Izuku questioned, interrupting his teacher. A quick flash of annoyance ran across Kadachi's face. Izuku shut his mouth and blushed slightly. As sorry sensei, please continue. This is because you will not be playing chess. Kadachi began. Izuku was about to open his mouth to ask another question before he saw the glare that his teacher was giving him. You are not playing chess because you will be fighting me and playing chess. Izuku blinked a few times. A female voice then said, it is your turn. The voice came from the chess board and Izuku could feel that the clock had started ticking. What are my failure conditions? He asked plainly. You will lose if the chess clock runs out or you are put into checkmate. Kadachi looked at his pupil while cracking his knuckles. Open the game. Kadachi's voice sounded steady but eager. Izuku only had a second before Kadachi lunged at him. Izuku leapt backwards, his muscles moving out of pure reflex. His sensei had stretched out his arms to try and grab him. That's his game. Izuku thought to himself. I lose if time runs out, so Sensei just needs to incapacitate me. Izuku's eyes darted around the room, he knew this place well. Sensei sometimes changes a few things here or there, just to mix it up a bit, but this place looks identical to last time. Izuku sprinted to a nearby shelving unit, it was empty and in disrepair. He jumped, diving in between two of the shelves. When Sensei reached the unit, he and his pupil locked eyes. I'm faster than him for the first second or two. Izuku's eyes darted to the chess board. The game just started, I can just do a simple move. Just moving a pawn would be enough. When his eyes met with his teachers again, he instantly broke into a sprint. Kadachi only took a split second to follow suit. When the young Midoriya reached the board he quickly looked at the state of it. Only a pawn was moved, a simple opener. He moved a pawn of his own before he noticed just how close his teacher was. There was a gentle whirring coming from the board, and time seemed to slow. Izuku could feel the air in his lungs move, his breathing slow. Sensei just needs to hold me down. Make it so I can't take a move. I have to have another way to win as well. Combat has unwritten rules. Opponents have things that they refuse to do, weaknesses. What is Sensei's weakness in this moment? Izuku's thoughts are broken with a gentle, it is your turn. Izuku sidestepped his opponent's tackle again, but this time he could feel a hand brush his side, grabbing his shirt. There was a strong tug, and he lost his balance as he was flung to the ground. He landed on his back, feeling the force flow through him. 
Thankfully, Sensei wasn't on top of him yet, he still had time to win this. Izuku rolled away from his teacher, who took a moment to turn to face his fallen opponent. Izuku did a kip up, not wasting a moment to get back onto his feet. His blood was really starting to pump now, and he could feel his limbs loosening. As Kadachi ran at him, Izuku looked for an opening, a way out, to get back to the board. His mind found a solution, and he hoped his body could fulfill it. He ran at his teacher, screaming. Kadachi looked resolute and continued his own sprint, but right before they reached each other Izuku dived down, his small body going right between his teacher's legs. He rolled on the ground before seamlessly getting up. He continued with his momentum, reaching the chessboard and making another move. This can't continue. Eventually Sensei is going to catch me. He might be older than I am, but he has much more stamina than I do. By this time Kadachi had changed direction, his body efficiently moving toward his target. Izuku's eyes darted to the board. Wait, magnets. Without another thought he picked up the board. The pieces held in place just with the magnets. Izuku turned, facing his teacher with the board in his hands. Kadachi's eyes widened as he tried to stop himself. Before he crashed into Izuku, the board fell from the boy's hands. And on impact the pieces flew away from it scattering about the warehouse. You didn't say that I would fail if I couldn't play the game anymore. Izuku stated confidently. His breathing was speeding up. His mind and body both being used at full throttle did wear him down a bit. Kadachi had fallen to the floor and was laughing as he stood up. Excellent, Midori Akun. The teacher brushed himself off. I didn't think I needed to make a rule against doing what you did, but now I guess I will. Kadachi bent over and picked up a piece that had landed near him. It was the Black Queen. I'm sorry, Sensei. Does that mean that I lost? Izuku looked forlorn, ready to apologize more for what he had done, but his teacher kept smiling at him. Don't feel bad. I would put this as a win for you. After all, I never stated the rule and in some ways you did defeat my intention. Kadachi hands Izuku the Black Queen. Take a break, get some water. I'll put the board back together and then we can try this again. But next time, please do try to play the game. Izuku let out a nervous chuckle. Why yes sensei. Izuku bowed to his teacher walking away from him to go get water. The day after that training was a normal day for Izuku. Waking up, going to school and classes. Thankfully, because of the lunch incident. The school made it so Bakugu couldn't get within a certain distance of Izuku, just in case Bakugu's quirk accidentally hurt him again. For that fact, and a few others, Izuku had been having a pretty good life in the past month. Today, after school he was going to meet with Kadachi to have a chess game and talk more about his future. When he actually reached Kadachi's office that afternoon, he noticed something odd. The chess board wasn't set up and Kadachi looked like he was ready to leave. As sensei, Izuku asked nervously, unsure of what was happening. Today we won't be playing chess. Sorry about that, Midori Akun. Kadachi gave him a warm smile. Something came up on my end and I might be called away at any moment. Izuku looked at his teacher's face, and he could see a sadness behind the smile. However, Izuku shook his head, dropping that line of thought. I would still want to talk to you about a few things, so please, have a seat. All right, sensei. Izuku sat down across from Kadachi. It had only been around a month since they started training, but so many things had happened then. He had read several books about heroes and villains alike. He had played countless games of chess against computers and his teacher, not to mention the combat training that completely exhausted Izuku's stamina by the end of it. What do you want to do for high school and beyond, Midori Akun? Kadachi took out a piece of paper that Izuku recognized. Earlier that year, they had to fill out papers talking about where they wanted to go for high school. Earlier, you wrote that you wanted to go to UA, and I was wondering, is that still a goal of yours? If he heard it from anyone else, Izuku knows that he would have heard a tone of mockery or pity. No one would ever expect a quirkless child to get into UA and thrive, but Kadachi sounded real and genuine. This caused a smile to creep across the young Midoriya's face. Uh, well sensei, that was a while ago. He responded, laughing nervously, considering that I want to be a vigilante. I don't think being at any form of hero course would be a good idea. Kadachi nods his head in agreement. It's good to hear you say that, Midori Akun. I was afraid I would have to explain that to you myself. Kadachi smiled at his student, but the question still stands of where do you want to go then? Ideally, we should have done this earlier, but I think we both got a bit excited about the training. Yeah, sounds like it. Izuku scratched the back of his head. He was thinking, isn't there a high school near UA without a hero course? He said after a few moments. Kadachi looked up, trying to remember. He turned to type on his computer before nodding his head. Yes, Murai High School. It's located several blocks away from UA. It says it's a private school that focuses on science and engineering fundamentals. Kadachi turned his head back towards Izuku. Would you like to go there? Izuku put his hand to his chin and thought. Maybe. You said it was private. How much is it? I wonder what I would study once I'm there. How far away is it from here? Does it have dorms? Would I have to get my own food or would there be a cafeteria? 
Izuku started to rattle off questions before Kadachi stopped him. SSHH. Kadachi used the harsh shush that teachers have. To answer some of your questions, it appears that it is rather expensive, and there are dorms with an included meal plan. Izuku shook his head. I don't think we could afford that. Izuku frowned for a moment before asking if there was anywhere else in the area. Well hold on, Midoriya-kun, according to this, Kadachi was pointing to the screen of his computer, there is an essay contest to get quite the scholarship. I'm not saying you should go to Murai, but when you get home look into it, and if you want to go I strongly suggest entering the contest. From what I've seen about the school so far it looks like it would be a good fit for. Kadachi was cut off by the ringing of a phone. His face lost its expression as he reached down to his pocket and took out his cell. This is Kadachi. Yes, she's at work still. All right. How long? Ten minutes or so. Yes, yes, all right. He hung up and put his phone away. I'm sorry, Midoriya-kun, but I have to go. I need to see someone. Kadachi stood up, grabbing a bag of his things and shutting down his computer. All right, sensei, I hope everything is okay. Izuku glanced at the phone before he put it away. The caller ID was from the hospital. I hope so too. And maybe you can meet them one day. I bet you'd get along. Kadachi bows to Izuku. Thank you for listening to what I have to say and not becoming a villain. Izuku blushes and bows deeper back towards his teacher. No, thank you, Kadachi-sensei. You saved me from myself, and I won't ever forget that. Izuku was laying down in his new bed, looking up at the ceiling. He'd been in the dorm for about a week now, and classes were finally going to start after an entire week of orientation. He rolled over onto his side, staring into the middle of the room. The room was rectangular, with Izuku's bed on one side and his roommate's bed on the other. The door was on the long side of the rectangle, with large dressers next to it, and the boys' desks were next to each other on the opposite side of the door. It wasn't the largest room Izuku had seen, but it was well kept. The walls were free of scuffs and the carpeted floor looked as if it was freshly and deeply cleaned before either of them had arrived. There was only one window in the room, between the boys' desks, but from what Izuku figured, every room only had one window. The carpet was a darker green color and the walls were a whitish yellow. On his side of the room, he had a few posters, two of All Might and one of a punk rock band that he listened to on occasion. His desk also held a figurine of All Might. No matter what happened to him, his faith in his hero was unwavering. Seeing his old stuff in this new environment made a smile arise on his face. This is a new day, he thought to himself. I'm free from Bakugou, and I can be whoever I want to be. His thoughts were interrupted when he heard the sound of a keycard sliding through the reader in his door. There was a light clicking noise as the lock disengaged. Izuku sat up in his bed as the door opened, and the familiar head of his roommate came through. They were holding a box of what appeared to be posters and knick-knacks. Every time Izuku saw them, he took a moment to adjust to what he was seeing, for his roommate's head was a cactus. Hey, Izuku. They said, smiling. My parents came by and dropped off some of my posters, so now you won't be the only one with them. He smirked at Izuku, the boy's rough cactus flesh stretching and compressing as he talked. Izuku realized he was taking a bit to respond before laughing nervously. Why yeah? Izuku took a breath in and regained his composure. So what you bring, Sabaku? Izuku got up and walked over, looking over Sabaku's shoulder to see what was in the box. Well, Izuku, the boy began, reaching into the box, and pulled out a poster. This is a helpful organic chemistry chart. He pulled out another poster. This is a periodic table. He pulled out the last poster. And this is a poster of Kamui Woods. Izuku nodded his head when he brought out the final poster. Sabaku looked at Izuku. You're judging me, aren't you? Izuku backed away, shaking his hands. And no, of course not. I just find it fitting th that your favorite hero is also a plant. It makes sense to have your favorite be someone similar to you, you know. Izuku was blushing slightly. He didn't want his roommate to think he was rude. It's just he didn't really have much experience making, or having, friends. Sabaku shrugged, putting his posters away. It's fine, dude, you can calm down. You just seem nervous. Sabaku sat down at his desk, turning the chair to face his roommate. In a lot of ways, I am, Izuku stated, moving over to his bed to sit down on. This is so surreal for me, being here. I didn't expect to win the essay contest. Hey man, when you showed it to me it was very touching. I think it's amazing that even though you don't have a quirk, you're going to reach as high as you can and never give up. Sabaku smiled at the boy and Izuku couldn't help but smile back. Toj Sabaku, you're really not that bad. You're making me think it was just my old school that was rotten, but I know better than that. Each year Murai High held an essay contest. And from that contest there were two winners, one male and one female, who would win free entry into the school. They both had to maintain a high average to keep the scholarship. But Murai put a great deal of faith in who they selected. This year the male winner, who was a very last-minute entry, was Midoriya Izuku. A quirkless boy, but he made up for his lack of a quirk with pure ambition and resolve. His essay was one filled with vigor and determination. Anyone who read it could see that. 
The school also took the recommendation from a teacher of his, Kadachi, along with his transcript as a sign that Izuku would be a good fit in the school. People who read the essay were slightly shocked. However, when they actually saw Izuku, most were expecting a straight-laced kid who'd had bad experiences. But what greeted them was a bit off from that. A loose-fitting tank top under a baggy sweatshirt. And not to mention the multiple piercings the boy had. The principal had to resist raising an eyebrow when he initially saw the child. But after talking with him for a few minutes, he was surely the one who submitted the essay, and so he shrugged off the appearance of the child as just the result of his past. While Izuku was busy writing his essay for Murai, countless students were filling out their applications for UA. School transcripts, teacher recommendations, a letter from one's parents. Just the first stage was an intensive process. All this was happening several months before school was even over. Bakugu found the entire process annoying. Boring and tedious. No one had heard any feedback from their submissions until a month later. Students that were selected, of which there were still loads, were to take a time multiple choice test. The stated reasoning behind it was to test each student's aptitude for being a hero. While this was true, the test had an ulterior motive, to gauge the personality of the student in order to see if they would be a good fit into the UA community. The test was administered at the schools that the students currently attended. Two hours was the maximum time allotted for the test. Some students labored over it, taking each question as their own challenge and exhausting the entire two hours. Others breezed through it, taking only half an hour on it. No one knew how the test would be graded, but some of them figured it was a personality test, especially since some of the questions didn't seem to have a wrong answer. Bakugu didn't figure that out, and simply breezed through it, not caring to double-check any of his answers before he handed in the test after only 20 minutes. It took two months to hear back from the results of the test. Over 600 students received a letter stating that at a specified time and place they were to go in order to take the final entrance test, a physical exam. Bakugu had grinned with delight when he had read his acceptance, almost burning the letter in his hands. He was on the path to becoming a hero, to proving to that worthless Deku that the powerful get what they want. It was the start of Izuku's high school career. After one full day of classes, mostly just going over the curriculum and such, Izuku felt good about his upcoming years here. The teachers seemed fair and the classes would be difficult but informative. That afternoon after classes, he called his mom and talked about how he was excited for the upcoming times. Hey mom, Izuku started the call with. He was leaning on the wall of his dorm room, the phone up to his ear. How are you, Izuku? I hope your first day went well. She responded. Her warm tones made him feel at ease. Uh-huh, it went really well. All of my teachers seem really good at what they do, and I'm eager to learn. That's good, honey. I, I miss you a lot already. Her voice was starting to break up. Izuku figured this would happen. It's okay, mom. I'll call you if anything happens and I'll see you again soon enough. This isn't a hero course, so I imagine I'll be nice and safe. I love you, Izuku. I love you too, mom. Izuku hung up the phone before tossing it on his bed. He let out a happy sigh just as Sabaku turned around and motioned him over. What's up? Izuku asked his roommate, who was looking at his computer. They just released who's in class 1 of UA. The plant man stated excitedly. Izuku tilted his head in question. The school announces who's in it. The young Midoriya asked. Sabaku shook his head. Nah man, reporters figured it out. Not that it was too hard, we have a list of names and faces. Izuku looked at the laptop screen, and sure enough, a list of names and faces scrolled by. Are you sure we should be doing this? I mean, isn't it an invasion of privacy? Or something. Izuku sounded nervous. He didn't want to look at the screen, but he admittedly was curious to know who made it in. We'd find out sooner or later, Sabaku assured him, brushing off Izuku's concern. Why not just take a look now? So Izuku decided why not, and took a look at the screen. Ayama Yuga, Ashido Mina, Asuitsuyu, Ida Tenya, Iraraka Achaku, Ajiro Mashurao, Kaminari Denki, Kirishima Aijiro, Kota Koji, Sato Rikido, Shoji Mizo, Jairo Kayoka, Siro Hanta, Takoyami Fumikage, Todoroki Shoto, Hagakir Toru, Suket Fudo, Shiriko Ikioi, Kadachi Kairi, Geyarazu Momo. As Izuku scanned through the names several of them got his attention. The first was Ashido Mina. Her pink skin and hair was quite the eye-catcher. The second was Ida Tenya. All Izuku could think about was if he was related to the hero in Genium. Third was Todoroki Shoto. He had heard rumors that Endeavor's son was finally old enough for high school, but never believed that he really even had a son. Fourth was Shiriko Ikioi, who honestly didn't have a particularly flashy appearance or stylish quirk like Ashido Mina had, but what drew Izuku's eye to him was the fact that he was in a wheelchair. Then finally, the name that made Izuku double-take was the penultimate one, Kadachi Kairi. Izuku whipped his eyes over to look at the picture before a mass amount of confusion crossed him. 
The person who looked at him back was off. Something about their form made Izuku think of what would happen if you put a person through a stretching machine. Their face was elongated, and their body was lanky. One of their arms was several inches longer than the other. The hand on the longer arm was larger as well, and it looked like it was covered in these furry scales. Izuku looked into their eyes, and he could see Kadachi sensei's eyes looking back at him. This was Kadachi's child, but he had wondered why his teacher had never brought her, yeah, her, up before. Izuku looked at the roster. He wanted to try and guess the quirks they had, but all he could think about Kairi, that was, until Sabaku broke his concentration. Well, Momo-chan, Sabaku said with disbelief. Izuku looked at the cactus man with disbelief. Wait, Chan, Izuku shouted, pulled from his thoughts. You know her. Sabaku nodded his head. Yeah I do. She was my neighbor for years. Sabaku took out his phone and scrolled through his contacts. Found her. I still have her number. Might give her a call later. It could be fun to catch up. Izuku stared at his roommate. He was feeling nervous just talking with someone who knew someone going to UA. Before Izuku could voice his grievances, Sabaku dialed the phone and pressed it against the side of his cactus, right where the ear would be. Several of the spines pressed themselves on the screen. Sabaku left the room after that. The last thing Izuku heard from him was a Momo-chan. It's cactus head, remember me. While Sabaku was on his phone call, Izuku sat down at his desk and looked at the time. It was only 4.30, but for Izuku today felt like it was going on for eternity. He was waiting for something, and it was supposed to have happened by now. Right when Izuku was about to give up hope on it happening today, there was a bing noise from his phone, and he scrambled to check it. Sure enough there was a news outlet that had posted a new story. A smile crept across Izuku's face as he opened his phone to read it. The headline made him shudder with delight. Vigilante exposed a small pro hero opus as part of Crime Ring. The article itself was basic and a bit plain, all things considered. It went over how a new and unknown vigilante went into a small hero agency and took surveillance footage. The footage in question revealed that the agency often met up with known villains where they talked about shipments. The entire ordeal was scandalous, to say the least, and very incriminating, to say the most. The icing on the cake, for Izuku at least, was the inclusion of an excerpt of the video surveillance log. Izuku put his headphones in, sat down on his bed, and pressed play. The footage showed the interior of a building. It had a white tile floor, plain white walls, and a cheap, white tiled ceiling. There were a few chairs and what was presumably a front desk. The entire room looked like a generic waiting room, and that's because it was. It was the pro-hero suited Snake's hero agency. He was a small-time hero who helped people trapped in rubble as well as assisting in asset recovery. His snake-like quirk allowed him to slither in and out of places easily. In the lobby was suited Snake himself along with someone else. The other person had a thug-like aura coming off of them. Both of them were opposite the entrance when they turned their heads to look. There was a knock on the door. The thug shrugged his shoulders, and Suited Snake shook his head before walking to go see what the knock was about. The moment the door opened Suited Snake leapt backwards, dodging what was a blur on the camera. The thug had a look of shock on his face, before pulling out a knife from his pocket. A voice filled the room, it sounded deep and distorted, as if by a machine. Open the game. It came from the direction of the door as someone rushed in towards Suited Snake. His body moved, slithering out of the way as the stranger turned to face him. The front of the stranger was now directed at the camera. One could immediately tell that they were not older than 16. They had long dark hair pulled back into a short ponytail. It was hard to make out with the grainy camera what color it was. The stranger was wearing a pair of goggles. They looked angular and the lenses extended backwards, seemingly farther than they needed. The stranger's eyes were gray, almost as if the color was sucked out of them. Also on their face was a large mask. It covered from their nose all the way down to their chin. It was made out of some form of metal and extended forward a bit. The rest of the stranger's outfit was basic and plain. A white collared shirt with the sleeves rolled up in plain, black pants. They were also wearing a set of tight black gloves that had a semicircle cut out near their base on the top. The last thing of note about them was they were carrying what looked like a metal walking stick with a small orb on top. I am the Grandmaster. The distorted voice rang through the air again. And you are guilty. The thug lunged at the Grandmaster, holding his knife in both hands, hoping to down the intruder before anything else could happen. The Grandmaster swung his walking stick up, pivoting it so the end that was on the floor was now being held in his left hand. He quickly brought the stick downwards, hitting the knife and hand coming at him. The thug backed away, holding his hand. The Grandmaster let go of the stick in his left hand and swung it again. This time the edge of it hit the thug. The Grandmaster's right hand that was holding the orb seemed to move a small bit, as the sound of an electric circuit being made cut through the air. The thug shook for a moment before falling to the ground convulsing. The Grandmaster looked around. Suited Snake disappeared from view. The intruder must have lost sight of them while dealing with the thug.
This didn't seem to faze him however, as he walked over to a sturdy door and bent down in front of it, taking something out of his pocket. He soon began picking the lock. He had set the cane down beside him in order to use both of his hands. Since the camera had more of an overhead view, the footage showed suited snake descending from the ceiling behind the Grandmaster. They were right behind them as well, so there wasn't a way that the stranger would know they were there. That's what Suited Snake most likely thought. At least, the Grandmaster still grabbed their stick and whirled it towards the hero, who quickly put their arm up to block the bulk of the hit. Due to how the stick was placed on the floor, the Grandmaster was holding the flat end and had hit Suited Snake with the orb. The hero smiled, whipping his arm forward to wrap it around the stick. The Grandmaster couldn't pull it free from his grip. The hero carefully reached out to grab the orb finding the buttons that activated the shock effect. Once he aligned his fingers with them, he was getting ready to press them when the Grandmaster's hand slid down the stick to the end and turned a knob at the base of the stick. The orb started to spark as Suited Snake fell from the ceiling, hitting the ground with a thud. Checkmate, the Grandmaster declared, returning to his work on getting the door open. That's where the video ended. Izuku could feel butterflies in his stomach just watching it. He quickly reread the entire article, wanting to stretch this feeling out for as long as possible. Sure this was posted on a tabloid site, but this type of caper was guaranteed to get more attention, especially once the trial happened. Izuku had brought a change to the world, a change that would be for the better. He put his phone down on his desk and took out one of his school books. He really should get started on his homework. He liked starting it the day it was assigned. Doing so gave him more free time. And it was a simple assignment anyways, it was just reading. Alrighty then. Izuku turned to see Sabaku entering the room, his cell phone still in hand. So how'd it go, Sabaku? Izuku returned to his book, reading it as Sabaku continued to talk to him. It was good talking to an old friend again. They got called away by some other dude though, but we did schedule a nice brunch. It's this weekend, you wanna come? Izuku nodded his head to the question. Yeah, sure. Izuku sat reading for a few seconds before whipping his head around. Wait, what? Izuku's face got red. I don't even know them. Thanks for inviting me, but I don't think that I should go. I mean, I don't even have a quirk or anything like that, and I've only known you for a week. Thanks for the offer, but no thanks. Sorry. Izuku sputtered through his words while his roommate shook his head and smiled. Come on, Izuku, it'll be fun. Besides, they're bringing a friend along as well, and I don't know who they are. So me bringing you along wouldn't be that bad. Sabaku saw Izuku's eyes darting around the room. His roommate was anxious, their hands receding into their hoodie's pockets, their tongue playing with their lip ring. It's just brunch, Izuku. And we both could afford to make some new friends. The young Midoriya wanted to rebut that, but stopped himself. It was true that neither he nor Sabaku had really any friends at the school besides each other. Izuku's eyes shifted over to his phone. It was locked and the screen was black. He knew that the news page about the vigilante was still open on it. However, Izuku realized that fighting this more than he had to would bring attention to himself. So he took a deep breath and looked at the cactus-headed kid. Sure, Sabaku, I'll go. Perfect. You'll love them and I'm sure their friend will be a cool dude as well. Sabaku's face lit up. Just don't get too excited, you might seem weird. Izuku chuckled after saying that. You remind me of myself in middle school. When Izuku looked up at Sabaku, his face was more serious. The sudden change surprised Izuku when he scratched the back of his head nervously. W what's wrong, Sabaku? I'm just trying to figure out what happened. Sabaku said, looking over Izuku, as if trying to find something. Izuku just smiled and clenched his fist. I'll, I'll tell you one day. Izuku's tone changed, he was more, withdrawn and he sounded smaller. Sabaku nodded his head, not just as an acceptance of Izuku's deflection but as a promise. Suited Snake's office was sealed off with police tape. Sukachi Nayamasa stood in the center of it, his eyes glancing around. The scene of the crime held no evidence towards the Grand Master's identity that was not obtainable from just watching the footage. Sukachi took a notepad from his pocket, along with a pen. Nothing taken but the tapes. Perp was let in, is what he scribbled down. He stood still for a moment, then his hand underlined perp was let in. The footage showed that the Grandmaster was let in by Suited Snake himself. This held a piece of information. Sukachi walked to the door and felt it with his gloved hand. Solid, no peephole. He whispered to himself. He ran his hand along the walls as well. No holes, no windows. If the Grandmaster knocked, then he had to know that people would be on the inside. There was no one else here, no windows. Anyone else might have just broken in, but they knocked. Perp did recon, new victim's schedule, he wrote down after mulling the facts over with himself. The combat seemed, prepared, thought ahead. Sukacha's head turned, he looked at the open door to the surveillance room. It was unmarked, and the lock was not the most advanced thing, but it was picked expertly on the footage. The Grandmaster must have trained for that set of skills, but for how long? The detective exhaled, he had only stopped by the crime scene on a whim. 
He just wanted to see it for himself, but now he was intrigued. He put the notepad and pen away, reaching into another pocket and pulling out his cell phone. Before he could make a call he heard an ever so familiar set of heavy and deliberate footsteps. He unconsciously sighed. It was a long and heavy sigh, the type people make before speaking with someone who was their acquaintance not by their own choice. Hello there, Arthur San. Sukacha's greeting held no friendliness. Oh please, Sukachi san I've told you this many times. The newly arrived individual stood in the doorway to the crime scene. He looked to be around his mid to late twenties. He had short brown hair and an elegant but pale face. His eyes were a brownish red that quite complemented his skin tone. He was built thin, but he could still most likely hold his own in a fight. He wore a black button-up shirt with tight, white gloves. There currently was a grey vest going over the shirt, a detective's badge on his left breast. I might be British, but as long as I'm stationed overseas here, please use my Japanese name. He smiled at Tsukachi, who simply shuddered in response. Fine then, Masayoshi Shajiki. Why are you here? Following me again. Tsukachi had to restrain himself from outwardly sneering at Masayoshi, who did nothing but laugh at this. Nonsense. I was in the area by coincidence and I saw your car. So I thought I might stop by. I didn't think you were working the Grandmaster case. I'm not. Masayoshi chuckled at this, going through the police tape. Well, I might be. I'm quite curious about it. Masayoshi pulled out a notebook from his pocket, took a scrap of paper out of it, and handed it to Tsukachi. This was stuck in my mailbox this morning. It appeared that the wind had coincidentally blown it there. Funny how things like that can happen. The smile on the detective's face didn't falter or sway. Cut the shit, Masayoshi-san, what do you want? There are only a few people on the force that caused Tsukachi to swear. Masayoshi's smile disappeared and was replaced with a blank face, no expression or emotion. This face was why the older detective hated the younger one. His quirk, truth, allowed him to tell if someone was lying or not. Ever since he laid eyes on Masayoshi his quirk was screaming liar at him. However, no matter what happened, no matter what the other detective did, he was operating within the law and within the guidelines that Tsukachi had even set for him. I want to be put his head on the case, or equivalent, Masayoshi stated in a firm manner. My quirk led me here, and I want to pursue it. Tsukachi let out another hard sigh. I was about to call the chief about this anyways, and you'll have to settle for equivalent. Tsukachi dialed in the number, bringing the phone to his ear. As it rang a smile crept along Masayoshi's face again. Oh, and why is that, my friend? Tsukachi looked him dead in the eyes. He didn't want to give this case to him, he wanted to refuse outright, but currently he didn't have a reason to do so, because I want to work it too. Masayoshi's head flew back and a cackle was unleashed into the air. Excellent. I cannot wait to work side by side with my friend. With both of us, there is no way the Grandmaster can escape. Masayoshi was practically dancing at this point, his arms outstretched and swinging wildly. Judgment will be cast. Izuku and Sabaku were sitting down in a cafe, drinks in front of them both. Izuku had hot chocolate, while Sabaku had tea. They were quietly sipping on their beverages when they saw someone waving in the distance at them. They both recognized the long black hair that was tied up behind her head from the picture in the list of class 1 a student. Cactus head. She called out cheerfully to her old friend. Izuku could feel his fingers starting to twitch and touch each other. Momo-chan. Sabaku called back. When Momo reached the cafe, Izuku noticed that there was someone following her. He was the same age as the rest of them and was wearing a black tank top. The most striking feature on the new kid was the lightning bolt in his blonde hair. Izuku immediately remembered the name Kaminari Denki, but to not seem like a creep, he kept it to himself. It's so good to see you after all this time, Momo said, her eyes moving from Sabaku to Izuku. I'm glad your friend could make it. She reached out her hand for Izuku to grab. My name is Yeyarazu Momo, but please, call me Yeyarazu. Izuku shakily reached out for her hand, grabbing it firmly and shaking it. And my name is Midoriya Izuku, and Umidoriya is fine. Izuku tried his best, but was failing to contain his nerves. After their handshake, Momo's friend stepped forward. My name's Kaminari. It's nice to meet you too. Kaminari put his hands up, and the other boys looked at each other before high-fiving him. You guys seem cool enough. At this point all four of them were seated. And before Izuku could even begin to think of what to ask, Sabaku spoke up. So what's it like studying at UA? The spiky-headed one asked, sipping his tea. Momo opened her mouth to speak before Kaminari interrupted her. It's the bomb. The first day was kinda rough but after that, it's been sweet. There's so many cool people and teachers, and the food is, like, amazing. Kaminari's face was beaming as he made a thumbs up. Momo glared at him though, before crossing her arms and speaking her thoughts. The food really is amazing, and I have to agree with him. The rest of the class is nice and certainly interesting to talk to. Just as she finished talking Izuku knew what he wanted to ask. His hands were in his hoodie's pockets, and he couldn't stop fidgeting. You um, Yeyarazu, I I have a question. 
What what do you know about Kadachi Kairi? Izuku felt odd asking a complete stranger for information about another complete stranger. Momo gave him a concerned look before shaking it off. Why do you want to know about her? At this point Momo and Kaminari's drinks arrived and they were set in front of them. Izuku's face was bright red, as he put his hands defensively in front of him. It's not that I want to be creepy about it or anything, it it's just I think her father was my teacher in middle school. Oh, well, Momo began, taking a sip of her own tea before she continued. I don't know for certain if her father is a teacher, but I could ask her for you. I don't want to sound rude, but is there any reason why you care so much? It's not that unusual for an old teacher of yours to have a child going to UA. No, you're right, it's just Kadachi-sensei was not just one of my teachers. Izuku's voice trailed off for a moment there. He was recalling being on the edge of the roof, looking down. He could always remember the feeling of the wind that day. The world suddenly snapped back for Izuku, and he shook his head. Sorry about that. It's just that Kadachi-sensei helped me in many different ways in middle school. He was far more than your usual teacher. Not to mention he said that he wished I could meet someone important to him one day. And I think he was talking about his daughter. Just as Izuku had finished and Momo was about to say something, Kaminari interrupted her again. Oh, I see. You want to check to see if she is the right gal. And then talk to her about her pops. Maybe hook up with her too. Izuku was in the middle of taking a sip when Kaminari had said the last bit. It took a brief moment for Izuku to register what Kaminari had actually said. And in response Izuku reflexively spat out what he was drinking. And it landed right on Kaminari. Needless to say this caused quite a stir. Izuku started frantically apologizing while getting paper towels to help wipe the hot chocolate off. Kaminari was taking it rather well, saying that he understood why Izuku did it, and he picked a bad time to make a joke. Once Kaminari was dried off, their brunch had arrived. Izuku sat there, ashamed about what happened, and ate his sandwich in silence. He was still listening to Sabaku and Momo talking and catching up with Kaminari butting in to make a cheap joke every now and again. The topics in the conversation ebbed and flowed, before eventually landing on what each of them wanted to be when they were older. For Kaminari and Momo, the answer was somewhat obvious and simple, they wanted to be pro-heroes. Both of them turned to Sabaku. Oh, I want to be a chemist or a biologist or something like that. A quirk researcher or someone who makes exotic tools for heroes, is what he answered. And the three others all nodded their heads. So did you try to get into the UA support classes? Kaminari asked him. Nah, I didn't even bother applying. Those classes are too engineering focused for what I want to do. So that's why I'm at Murai. It's all about chemistry and such. Kaminari smirked. I can't wait to see what cool discoveries come from Cactus Head. The blonde gave the cactus boy a thumbs up before looking at Izuku. So, Midoriya, what about you? What do you want to be when you grow up? Izuku stopped eating once his name was said and he just sat there in silence for a moment. His green eyes appeared deep in thought. He wanted to say someone who fights for justice. However, he knew they would ask more about that and he didn't want to explain his methods on how he would fight justice. I want to research quirks as well, he lied. I want to see why some seem to have stronger effects than others, and how different people can have the same quirk but express it in different ways. Momo nodded her head. That's a fine goal. I'm sure a lot of interesting discoveries can be made in that category. Izuku nodded back at her, a smile on his face. He felt a buzz in his pocket and took out his phone. Oh, sorry, guys, I'm gonna have to go. Something time-sensitive came up, and I need to deal with it. Izuku got up from his seat, putting his phone back in his pocket. It was good talking with you both though. He started to walk off, when he heard someone running up to him. Hey, Midoriya, wait up. The voice of Kaminari called out. The young Midoriya turned back to look when he walked into someone, his phone falling out of his pocket. Kaminari also ran into Midoriya, not expecting him to suddenly stop. All three fell to the ground, and it appeared that Kaminari dropped his phone as well. I am sorry. Izuku cried out, quickly getting back up while having his hand outstretched to help the stranger. The stranger shook their head, their brown hair shaking as well. No problem at all, young ones. They stood up, their black shirt partially covered in dirt from the fall. They patted themselves off, smiling at Izuku. Everyone can get overly excited about things. The stranger reached to the ground, picking up Izuku's green phone and offering it to him. I imagine this is yours. Yeah, thank you sir. Izuku took the phone and bowed. Don't mention it, but do be more careful. I'm sure not everyone will be as kind as I am. At this point, Kaminari was standing up, patting the dirt off of himself. The stranger reached down and picked up a yellow and black phone. And this is yours, I assume. Kaminari nodded his head and took the phone. Thank you. I shouldn't have called out like that. Sorry, Midoriya. The blonde smiled, and Izuku nervously shifted on his feet. No, it was my fault, Kaminari-kun. Izuku bowed again at Kaminari. Both of them froze for a moment. The same question rose in both of their minds. Why did I use the other's name? I hope you get to doing whatever it was you wanted to do. The stranger stated, waving at them. Be a tad more careful. 
both Izuku and Kaminari saw the stranger's eyes. The brown iris was colored almost a bright red in the area near the pupil. Looking at this made Izuku and Kaminari unconsciously take a step back. However, the stranger didn't notice this as they turned and walked off. What was I oh, right? Could I have your number, Midoriya? Kaminari was looking at Izuku, phone in hand. Oh, unsure. But why? Izuku was holding his own phone. I don't know, you seem like someone interesting. When Izuku heard that he blushed, he wasn't used to this type of attention from someone his age. I, uh, are you sure? Izuku muttered. I mean, you've only just met me. Are you sure I'm good enough for you to get my number? Dude, calm down. Kaminari started laughing. You need to give yourself more credit. Like, why not? Why aren't you good enough? That question struck a chord with Izuku. He wanted to state reasons, to explain how he was quirkless, but opted to just give the other his number. Thanks, dude. I'll also let you know about Kadachi. I'll ask them about their pops. Kaminari smiled at Izuku one last time before walking away. Momo and Kaminari were walking back to the UA dorms together after their brunch of tasty, filling sandwiches. Once they got far enough away from the cafe they ate at, Momo turned towards Kaminari. Kaminari, what did you think of Midoriya? Momo asked suddenly, to which Kaminari shrugged. I'm not sure what you mean. I mean, like, he seemed cool. It's just, he's our age right. I wasn't expecting him to have piercings or anything. Kaminari shook his head. He also looked like he had some rough times, and I'm sure that if you, like, have a bad enough experience, you'll not be the most normal. Momo nodded her head and sighed. I guess. I just hope that Midori's troubles are in his past. But also you need to watch where you're going. I saw you bump into him and that other guy. Hey, I was watching where I was going. I just didn't expect Midoriya to completely stop moving once I called for him. Momo rolled her eyes. Either way, I hope you apologize to whoever you two bumped into. Of course we did. We both have manners, you know. Kaminari shouted back at Momo before they both started laughing. Shortly after their talk, they found themselves at the entrance to Yue. They both strolled in. The gate they passed under making a confirming beeping noise as they walked through, and the full Yue campus came into view. The towering glass-covered main building was the largest eye-catcher. There were other buildings dotted around the surrounding area. They looked like small warehouses, and they were the gyms of Yue. Finally, the farthest out from the main building were the dorms, of which Momo and Kaminari walked over to the Class 1 building. They stepped up to the front door of their dorm, Momo taking out her student ID and touching the door handle with it. There was a click as the door unlocked. The two students entered the familiar entranceway of their dorm, right as they stepped through the door frame. Both Momo and Kaminari flinched as one of their fellow classmates was about to walk into them. Instead of colliding into them, they merely phased through. Their classmates' outline turned into a staticky blob where the two groups collided, quickly reverting once the collision ceased. Suket kun Momo shouted. The figure that walked through them moved one of their headphones off one of their ears. You can't just walk around listening to music and not paying attention. Sure your quirk can make it so you don't bump into people, but it's still startling for the people you walk through. Their classmate showed a wobbly smile. As sorry, Yeyurazu Chan. He said, bowing at her. Suket Fudo was the type to wander around, headphones in and listening to whatever jam he pleased, not minding nor caring much for what was going on around him. His quirk, static spread, allowed him to phase anything he was touching, and things touching what he was touching, through anything. He wore a plain white t-shirt with a black zip-up jacket on top of it. His hair was slicked back, and he had a black pair of disco pants. I'll try to stop. Stop being so hard on him, Yeyurazu, he just likes his tunes. Kaminari went to wrap his arm around Fudo, before phasing through him and falling to the ground. Though, sorry, the static outline around Fudo wiggled before snapping back into place. I still had my quirk up. Sorry, Fudo bowed to Kaminari, before quickly moving away and up the stairs. Kaminari got up, supporting himself on the wall. Jeez, that kid moves fast. Kaminari muttered under his breath, moving over to a couch and plopping down on it. Also in the common room were Siro Hanta and Ashido Mina. Mina was laying down on a couch looking at her phone while Hanta was in the kitchen making a grilled cheese. So, how did your date go? Mina teasingly asked, not even looking away from her phone. It wasn't a date. We just went out to meet with a childhood friend of Yeyurazu's. Kaminari sat back, crossing his arms in protest. I can't even picture you two dating. Hanta added, sitting down at the table near the couches. See, he gets it. Hey wait. Kaminari stood up to shout at his classmate. What do you mean you can't picture us dating? Mina and Hanta looked at each other and nodded knowingly. This just frustrated Kaminari, and he shook his head before getting up. I'll be in my room. Only one week had passed at the Hero Academy, and all of the new students were still getting used to living with each other. Sure, they all had their own separate rooms in the dorm, as well as their own bathroom, but most of the students had no experience living with someone who wasn't their family. 
Not that they had a great deal of time to interact with each other in the dorms anyways. So far this was the first day where they had come home without being physically exhausted. Aizawa sensei's teaching method was rigorous and tiring. He assured them that with time they would look back and think that their early lessons would be a cakewalk to do now, but that time hadn't come yet. The night passed uneventfully in the dorms. The students had a curfew of 9 p.m. and couldn't spend unnecessary time in the common room past 10. For some of them, it took some time to get used to their new sleep schedules, but by the end of the first week they all fell into the habit of going to bed at around 10 to 11. Thankfully, today was Monday. And according to UA regulations Monday needed to be less physically intensive to give the students more time to recuperate. During lunch, most of class 1 sat next to each other, or within a table or so. The school was not overly large by any means, but there was something taboo in the air about sitting with the upperclassmen or people who weren't in the hero course. Most of class 1 and noticed this when they first entered the dining hall, each class sitting with their own and minding themselves. Momo leaned over to Kaminari, showing him her phone. Isn't that the guy you bumped into yesterday? She asked, pausing to eat for a moment. Kaminari looked at the picture and nodded his head. His mouth was still quite full so he quickly chewed and swallowed. Yeah, he is. How'd you get a pic of him? The blonde-haired kid asked, an expression of question flicking between Momo and the picture. She tapped the screen and the image minimized. He's featured in a news article. Several other of the class 1A students perked up on hearing this. What did Kaminari do? Mina asked. She had put her own phone away a few minutes ago and was focusing on the plate in front of her. Hey I didn't do Kaminari started before being interrupted by the cacophony of his classmates' guesses. I heard that he might have bumped into someone important. Maybe he made a business guy late. Or he stopped an assassination. Or, or, hey, shush. Momo's voice broke through the noise. If you want to know who Kaminari interrupted, then listen. Everyone in class 1A, including Kaminari himself, was listening in. Momo had a way to get everyone's attention and hold it. So, apparently that guy's name is Masayoshi Shajiki, and he is a detective for the police. He was being interviewed because he is one of the lead detectives working on the Grandmaster case. She read the last three words with confusion before scrolling down the article, speed reading it. What's the Grandmaster? Hanta asked. He had his tape dispensing elbows on the table before Shoto brushed them off. Everyone's eyes were on him as he normally didn't say or do anything outside of class. Grandmaster is the highest rank one can achieve in chess, Shoto stated, turning his head towards Momo. Please, continue, I'd like to hear more. Shoto's plain and monotone voice hinted at some anticipation. His eyes were looking forwards, the rest of the class's eyes going between Momo and Shoto. This is what made him open up. They thought to themselves, well, Todoroki-kun. Momo began, unsure on how he wanted to be treated outside of class. The Grandmaster appears to be a criminal figure who outs other criminals' actions to the public. Their first heist was several days ago when they stole security footage from a hero agency. The footage in question proved that the hero agency had dealings with local criminals. Momo read, her eyes darting around her phone. Interesting. It now appears that they, or the Grandmaster, has left an open letter to everyone. They even attached the letter as an image. Hold on, I'll read it. I am the Grandmaster. For years now, this world has been biased towards those with powerful quirks. Society praises those born with flashy quirks and casts aside those without. We train heroes, but raise villains. The disenfranchised and the thrown away rise up in anger against those in command, solely because that is the only thing they feel they can do. My goal is to correct this fault in the line of thinking. The game plan in place is non-sustainable and will result in a draw. No more pieces on either side, just the two kings staring at each other in gridlock. I am determined to prevent this. I fight for those with dull quirks. I fight for those who lack a quirk. I fight for those who are pressured to become something that should not be necessary. Open the game. There was a silence at the table. Most of class wanna look between each other, their minds going over what they had been read. Shoto's voice broke the silence. Interesting. A vigilante with the goal of social reform is new. He looked at Momo. If all they've done is send a letter and steal one set of tapes, why is there an article about them? Her eyes turned back to the phone and started to frantically read it, trying to answer the bicolor-haired boy's question. Ah, oh, yes, it's because the letter was left. At the scene of the crime, she stated slowly, a bit of disbelief in her voice. Why is that special? I thought you said it was two separate Eve Kaminari started, left at the scene yesterday, while the police were currently investigating it. Wait, the police didn't notice the Grandmaster enter and leave a note. Kaminari looked surprised, and so did the rest of the class, except for Shoto. Curious, so they proved that they can outmaneuver the police, Shoto stated calmly. He pulled out his phone then got up from the table. I'm going to look into this myself. I'll be in the classroom if anyone needs me. No one stopped him from leaving. Everyone just sat around, before finally resuming to eat. How much longer do I have to wait? The raspy voice exclaimed in frustration. 
You said we would be attacking once school started. The owner of the voice, a man with long, tangled, gray hair, slammed his hands down on the table. He was in a musty bar. The air reeked of sweat and booze. It's alright, Shigaraki Tamura. Calm down, said a soothing voice coming from a computer placed on a nearby table. We must find the ideal moment to strike. And that moment is coming. I have intel that Class 1 is going to be taking a field trip this coming Friday. That is when we shall strike. Good. I don't want to wait any longer. The man sat down on a couch, picking up a controller. This is a game I've been wanting to start for a while. Kadachi Kairi wasn't at lunch that day. Not that she didn't want to be there, but she wasn't able to go. She arrived at her afternoon classes 15 minutes late, and was carrying an IV bag in tow. She wasn't a fragile person by any means. Her frequent visits to the hospital were side effects of her quirk. One third lightning. She was taller than average, around six own, and was lanky. Her arms and legs stretched outwards. There was muscle on them, but it looked misshapen and elongated. Patches of her skin were covered in these light blue scales. Tufts of short fur were also all over her body near the scales. Her right foot was a hoof. The structure in her leg changed from human to horse-like around their calf. This gave them an uneven walk. Lastly, there was her face. Most of her head had short black hair, but the hair near the right side looked buzz cut and was a silvery white. There were scar-like marks going down from her hair to her neck. Her left eye looked normal. It was a greenish-yellow in color, but her right eye was very different. It appeared split down the middle. One side was the same color as her left eye, while the other side was a sky blue. Every student glanced at her when she entered. The teacher, present Mike, momentarily stopped talking as she walked by. After she sat down the teacher's voice resumed, filling the room with his lecture. After the lecture, Kaminari walked up to Kairi, who was sitting at her desk eating rice. She was the only person allowed to eat in the classrooms, and only if she missed lunch. What do you want? She asked, not even looking up at the sparky kid. Yesterday I met with a friend of Yeyurazu's and they had a friend who said they might know your dad. Kaminari spoke quickly. He was getting nervous. And why are you telling me? She asked, looking up at the blonde. I don't care if anyone knows my dad. Oh, all right. Kaminari was about to leave before he stopped himself. The kid's name is Midoriya, and he's a cool dude. He took a scrap of paper out of his pocket and put it in front of her. He looks like he's been through some stuff, and he said your dad wanted you two to meet one day. Kairi looked down at the paper, preparing to push it off the desk. Kaminari grabs her hand to stop her. Look man, just give him a chance. Kaminari was going to continue before a death glare from Kairi shut him up. He quickly removed his hand, and chuckled shakily. Oh, right. As sorry about that, caught her. Sorry about that, Kyrie san Kaminari took a step back. He did say that your dad helped him a lot. Message him or don't, up to you. Kaminari turned and went back to his seat, before getting ready for the next class to begin. That night Kyrie stared at her phone. She had the messaging app open with Izuku's number typed in. She looked at the message they had typed, and had reread it several times. She breathed in, before hitting send. She put their phone on the nightstand, and went to bed. Just before Izuku went to bed he saw a new message on his phone. It was from an unknown number. He opened it, a smile forming when he read the first two words, but quickly fading as he read the rest. I'm Kairi. Why did my dad spend time with you and not me? One month, less than thirty days. Izuku was standing in the warehouse panting heavily. On the other side of the room was his teacher, Kadachi. They both looked exhausted. Their stamina sapped from sparring. They both knew that in a month, school would be over, and Izuku would need to go start his new life. Kadachi sat down, rubbing his sore body. He picked up his water bottle and drank greedily from it. Midoriya Khan, I need to talk to you about something, Kadachi stated, patting the bench next to him. Izuku nodded, walking over and sitting next to his teacher. What is it, Sensei? The pupil looked up at his teacher, pure admiration in his eyes. We're getting close now to your new life, and to your debut. Kadachi reached out his hand and patted the young Midoriya on their head. His hand ran through the boy's curls. There are things that you need to know. And these things are vital to anyone who wants to change society. Izuku nodded his head. Let me get my book, sensei, he said, but paused for a moment. His teacher's hand was still on his head, and his breathing was a bit ragged. Kadacha's hand felt warm and it slid through his hair smoothly. Izuku loved this feeling. It reminded him of a long time ago, and it felt comforting. After a minute or so, Izuku blushed and brushed his teacher's hand aside. He walked over, grabbing one of his notebooks before heading back. Okay, sensei, please go on. The first is you must hide who you are. It would be awful if anyone, especially villains or the police, found out who you were. Kadacha's voice held the wisdom of experience. Izuku nodded, writing everything down. The second is you must state your intentions to the world early. You don't want the press putting words in your mouth. Izuku's hand whizzed across the page, his pencil making scratching noises. Finally, think of someone who you despise the most, someone who in your opinion deserves nothing. 
Izuku stopped writing for a moment, his eyes going up to Kadacha's face. Forgive them. Kadacha's voice was plain, but passionate. It is not your duty to judge them, and it is not your job to hold a grudge. When you forge a new future, it must be unbiased and unrestrained by your feelings and emotions. Let the new world judge people. Izuku was speechless. He could feel himself being targeted by that remark, and he knew who his teacher was talking about. He didn't want to forgive Bakugo. His heart lurched at the idea of it. His body was sweating and his throat felt dry. Izuku's hands gripped his pencil and his shorts. Sensei, I Izuku began, his voice cracking. Midoriya-kun, let me tell you a story. Kadachi put his hand on Izuku's and gave him a smile. Many years ago there was a vigilante who called himself Forecast. He didn't have a hero license because he had never thought the heroic path was for him. He worked as an accountant and had many clients. When he was 23 he, through cross-checking a few things, figured out that a client of his had missing funds. Being the vigilant accountant he was, he decided to try and track down the funds. This led him to a meeting between villains. Thankfully he had the wisdom to run away, but he managed to get proof before he left. This event is what sparked the flame in his heart that made him want to be a hero. However, he soon learned that unless you went to school for it, there were a great many hoops to go through if you wanted your hero license. So he decided to work outside of the law, giving the police stacks and stacks of evidence and tips about villainous activity. At first, the police hated him, but soon the police chief at the time was thanking him. Working inside the boundaries of the law is a slow process, and there are cases that couldn't wait for that. All good things come to an end though, and he was caught. A group of villains led by one in a large, black, angular mask had laid a trap that Forecast couldn't resist. He fell for it, like an idiot and soon found himself in a room of enemies. They stated that they had figured out his identity, even providing pictures of his family as proof. It was clear that the villains could end him at any point, but their leader didn't kill him outright. They gave him an ultimatum. Either he was to kill himself publicly by sunset the next day, or they would go after his family. This broke him, and so he did what he felt was his only choice. He confessed to the police chief. Everything. All of it. And the chief did something that he will never be able to repay. The chief put him into witness protection and even publicly faked his death. The media had a field day with it. At the end of it, the only one who knew of Forecast's true intentions was the police chief. Everyone else only had the media's image of him, a villain who stole what he wanted to steal with no regard for justice. Thankfully, he didn't have a wife or even a girlfriend at the time, so it was just his family he was saying goodbye to. Kadachi was getting teary-eyed. His composure had reached its limit, it seemed. Soon after being relocated he got a job teaching, and soon after that, he fell in love. Kadachi squeezed Izuku's hand, as if trying to hold back emotions. But that's a story for another day. Throughout the story Izuku's eyes didn't move from his teacher. The story felt personal, like it needed to be heard. He simply nodded his head, a sign of acknowledgement, before raising a question. Why are you telling me this, sensei? There are three things that Forecast did wrong. Kadachi started. He had recovered his composure and his teaching voice had returned. The first is that he never put a great deal of effort into hiding himself. The villains never needed to take off his mask to find out who he was. The second is that he never stated why he did what he did, and so the media created his public image and not himself. There was quite a bit of silence after Kadachi had listed the first two things. As sensei, Izuku asked to provoke his teacher. What was the third thing? Kadachi let out a sigh. The third thing was from, well, it was from him never forgiving me, and I refused to let anyone else make that mistake. Wait, sensei, I thought you were forecast. Upon saying this, Kadachi let out a dry laugh. I knew you could figure it out. Kadachi tried to smile, but it was like he couldn't muster the strength for it. There are things I've done since becoming Kadachi that my past self would have found unforgivable, and I feel unfit to ever pick up the vigilante torch again. And what I said is true. I refuse to allow anyone else to make that mistake. Kadachi put his hand on Izuku's shoulder. I believe in you, but we should wrap up. I'm sure we both have places we need to be. One week later, Izuku was fidgeting in his seat. His teacher was sitting across from him looking over drawings and sketches he had made. After going through the entire stack Kadachi put them down and looked at Izuku. Well, Midoriya-kun, I think you have several good ideas in here. The teacher stated, giving his student a smile. Thank you, sensei. I did a lot of readings on various heroes and villains and their costumes, so I think something that I can easily put on and take off would be best. Izuku smiled back at his teacher. I see you also want something to hide your eyes behind, as well as your general face structure. Kadachi flipped back through some of the drawings, looking for a specific one. I think you mentioned contacts, but that's not going to be the best idea. Contacts take time to take out and put in. I do like the idea of a mask with a voice changer in it. So, sensei, what do you recommend for my eyes? Izuku asked. His teacher reached behind him, grabbing a case and opening it. Kadachi shuffled around the insides before pulling out a small glass-like square. 
I got this years ago. Here, look through it. Kadachi handed the young Midoriya the square. And when he looked through it, the effects were immediately apparent. Everything that was seen through the square was grayscale. Nifty, isn't it? I imagine we could easily get a pair of lenses made out of it. Izuku nodded his head. Oh, I thought of something else, Kadachi-sensei. Izuku reached into his bag on the floor and pulled out another notebook. I've been researching lenses and refraction, and I think we could make lenses that could extend my field of view. Izuku put the notebook, each page filled with various designs and schematics, in front of Kadachi, who tabbed through it. Interesting, but why would you want this, Midoriya-kun? Kadachi looked over the notebook at his student. I don't have a quirk, so I'll need some way to augment my abilities when dealing with people who do have quirks. I think removing blind spots in my vision is a good way to start. Izuku was rocking back and forth in his chair while talking. Kadachi peered over their designs another time before putting down the book. This is all good work, and you've made so much progress since we started, Midoriya-kun. There is really only one thing left about your, er, hero persona. What's that, Kadachi-sensei? What are you going to do about your public persona? I'm not talking about your hero persona, but your persona. When Kadachi asked the question, he expected Izuku to pause and think. However, Izuku just smiled at his teacher, reaching into his backpack and bringing out a plastic bag of what looked like piercings. They're fake, of course. I'm not getting real ones. But if I wear these and change my wardrobe a bit, then me and the Grandmaster will be night and day. No one would think about connecting us. Izuku smiled, sure of himself. The Grandmaster. Kadachi raised an eyebrow. Is that what you're going to call yourself? Izuku simply nodded his head as a response. Well then, I suppose it does fit the training you did to get yourself here. I like it. One week before middle school graduation, Izuku was sitting at home. He had several notebooks opened at various pages and too many tabs open on his web browser. He was checking and cross-checking everything. He had narrowed down his search for his first caper to three possible candidates, and he was busy figuring out which one to actually strike. Deciding to take a break, he set his pencil down and looked behind him. There was his closet, though he couldn't see it. He could practically feel the presence of the Grandmaster's clothing behind all of the others. Izuku had used his allowance to buy it, and he felt a fire burn in him once he remembered it was there. He had already sent off his essay to Murai, and he was awaiting a response. He felt nervous, but he had Kadachi look over it and the teacher was quite confident about Izuku's chances. Going to Murai wasn't essential to the plan, but it did make quite a few things easier and Izuku would never turn down the opportunity to go to a good school. His thoughts shifted. I wonder what Bakugu is doing right now. Izuku shook his head. He didn't need to think about him anymore. I hope he didn't get into UA. He didn't deserve that school, he doesn't deserve anything. Izuku's thoughts trailed off when he remembered what his teacher had told him. See can I forgive Bakugu? What would be the point if I did? Izuku checked his phone. It was late, but the time wasn't what he was after. He scrolled through his short list of contacts until he found Bakugu Katsuki. He thought he had deleted it, but here it was. He was tempted to delete it now. He wanted to delete it. He wishes he could scrub that boy from his mind, but he hesitated. I need to forgive him. That's what Sensei told me. So Izuku put his phone down and resumed working. If everything went according to plan, by his first week of high school, the Grandmaster would be known to the public. Once that happened, Izuku could never look back. Part 2 Reasons Why Izuku stared at his phone, reading and rereading the message he received from Kairi. It was 13 words long, but brought up so many questions. He wanted to respond with some of them, but thought it best to not bring them up now. Izuku finally settled on what he would send. Are you free to talk tomorrow afternoon? Of course, he didn't get an answer that night. It wasn't until the early morning that any response came to him. Sure, I'll be in the park near UA at 7. Izuku sat on a bench in the park, looking up at every person passing him by. He realized he knew what Kairi looked like, but he didn't know if Kairi knew what he looked like. He had arrived early, at around 6.50. The park used to be quite large, but a while back a sizable portion of it was bought by Yue and turned into a training ground. Once 7 o'clock rolled around Izuku started to check his phone every couple seconds or so. He could feel his body shaking and his fingers twitch. Not only was he meeting a new person, but someone who might have beefed with him from the beginning. Before he could dwell on these thoughts for too long, a lanky figure emerged from the path leading to Yue. Izuku could immediately recognize who it was. He stood up and bowed deeply. So you're Midoriya, I take it? Kairi questioned. She had a water bottle with her that she took a swig from. Call me Kairi san Understood. Her voice sounded different from what Izuku imagined. It had an authority to it, though it held no malice. Izuku nodded his head at her. Yes, Kairi san I understand, was all Izuku could say. He wanted to say so much more, but he knew that Kairi needed to be the one to lead the conversation. Kairi walked over and sat down on a bench next to his. What did Kadachi teach you? Her tone was stern now, filled with an intent to pry the answers from Izuku's hands if needed. I, I'm not sure what you're asking. 
He taught biology. Izuku spent a good moment picking each word. Not what I meant. What did Kadachi teach you? I can't see any other reason why you would regard him so highly otherwise. Her comment at the end was spat out like an insult. Izuku stammered for a moment. He, uh, he taught me to. He taught me to believe in myself. Izuku felt like he was walking across a rope bridge that could snap at any moment. Kairi's two colored eyes were staring at him, examining him. Really now? She began. Her words lingered in the air before she let out a sigh. I wish he could have told that to me. Kairi slumped on the bench, putting her head on her hand. I never knew him. He didn't start visiting me until last year, basically. W what? Izuku blurted out. I don't believe that. Kairi shot him a stern glare. And Izuku covered his mouth with his hands. Well, that's what happened. He was the only family I had, and he spent all of it with some other kid. Kairi was standing up now, her eyes boring into Izuku. Why? She questioned, her face turning to anger. Why? Her words boomed like thunder, and Izuku curled up. What makes you special? Important. More so than me. Izuku had his head between his legs, tears beginning to form in his eyes. I'm his daughter. And who are you? Everyone in the park could hear her words. And Izuku could feel himself breaking down. Do you know what it's like to be alone? To sit there in a hospital room and never have a visitor, a guest, no one. That last line struck a chord with Izuku. He swallowed his fear, clenched his fists, and stood up. I do know, Kairi san He firmly stated, eyes looking into Kairi's. Not the exact same experience, but I know. I know the feeling of being alone, the feeling of excruciating isolation. In school I had no one, no one on my side, no one to turn to. My mother did love me, but she had no idea what to do with me. My closest friend was a massive bully. Izuku tried to make himself taller, to make it clearer that they were on equal footing. This world is rotten, and cruel, and unfair, and a game set against everyone. It is unfortunate that you've been alone, and that you're different, but I am too. Izuku looked down at his hands. I'm quirkless. I'm a nobody. He looked back up in Kairi and smiled. If it were a few months ago, no one besides my mother would have missed me if I died. Izuku stammered for a moment before finding his footing again. I'm sorry, Kairi, Izuku continued, the fire of his passion burning brightly. I'm so sorry. His voice was sincere, and Kairi could tell. Both of them had tears rolling down their cheeks. I think I know what you need, it's what I needed. Something that so many people have and don't even realize it. Something that is shared and passed around except to those who feel like they lack it. Something that can be given, but must be understood to be accepted. Izuku lunged forward and wrapped his arms around Kairi. She wanted to break away before realizing how long it has been since she was held. L listen to me, Kairi san Izuku's voice was breaking and there was a knot in his throat. Why you? He squeezed Kairi tighter. You are not alone. He let Kairi go and took a step back, doing his best to smile through his tears. No matter what you feel, you are not alone. And to prove it, Izuku reached out his hand. Kairi just stared at it. My name is Midoriya Izuku. Please just call me Midoriya, and I want to be your friend, Kairi san Izuku stared at Kairi, and Kairi stared at the hand. There was a silence in the air as if time itself had stopped. Izuku was shaking. His mind had finally caught up to everything he said and did. But he knew he couldn't move his hand away. He meant it. Everything he said, so he needed to prove it. Kairi's hand moved, slowly, inching closer and closer before grabbing Izuku's hand. I it's nice to meet you, Midoriya. Kairi's voice was shaking, her eyes clouded with tears. You have my number, Kairi san Izuku mustered his strongest smile, and with the most amount of enthusiasm and joy he managed stated, Please don't hesitate to message me if you want to talk, or if you need someone. Izuku was finally recovering from his crying when he noticed Kairi coming closer. I want another hug. Her arms were already around Izuku when she said that. Izuku blushed, before shaking that away. This was a friend who needed help, and he would be there as long as he was needed. It had been around 20 hours since Kairi talked with the green-haired boy. She was laying in her bed. Time was passing slowly, so she decided to get up and see if anyone was around. She never really spoke to her classmates much during the first week, so she decided to try and turn that around and maybe make a new friend. Both Hanta and Mina were down on a couch looking at their phones while Kaminari was in the kitchen, and Shoto was near a window with his laptop. She spent a moment trying to decide who she wanted to talk to before arriving at the conclusion that Kaminari was likely the most approachable. Hey, Kaminari. She was trying her best to sound welcoming as she slid into the kitchen area. What's up? Kaminari looked at her for a moment before chuckling. Never expected you to be so casual. The boy gave her a smile. So what you wanna talk about? Nothing really. I just wanted to talk. It took Kaminari a moment to respond. Huh. Alright. Never expected this. Kaminari grabbed his toast from the toaster, putting it on a plate. Something happened. He asked, spreading butter on the toast. Sorta. Kairi began. She had her arms crossed. I was told to try and make friends. So. Hi. 
Both of them laughed for a second at the awkwardness of what was said before Kaminari moved his plate to the nearby table and sat down. He motioned for Kairi to join him. So you picked me cause we got the same type of quirk. He took a bite of his toast. Kairi sat down across from him and shrugged. Honestly, I don't know. You seem nice, and you spoke with me yesterday. But it is nice that we are both electric types. Kaminari nodded. What was your quirk called again? Wasn't it something something lightning? One third lightning, yeah. So, Kaminari paused for a moment. Why one third? Can you only make lightning on a third of you? Kairi sat for a moment, closing her heterochromatic right eye in thought before shaking her head. Not quite, but sorta. Kairi held out both of her hands. Her left hand was fairly normal. Maybe the fingers were a bit long, but nothing too bizarre. On the other hand, however, were spots of fur and some scales. The fingers also stretched out slightly longer than they should. How much mythology do you know? Kairi looked up at the boy. He shook his head. None really, not my favorite thing to look at. Well, a long time ago there was the legend of the Kirin. They were mythical beasts said to have elemental powers. But since the arrival of Quirks, it is said that Kirin became real. Really? How? Kaminari put down the toast and leaned forward, eager to hear what his classmate had to say. Well, there was a couple with many children, and each child had a Quirk mutation where they were all a different element. Rare, but not impossible. If my mom is to be believed, then she is the descendant of the one with storm powers. Kyrie looks off in the distance. There was a slight pain in her expression before she pulled herself back. Is your mom a pro hero? Kyrie just looked at him and shook her head. She wanted to go pro, but couldn't. Kyrie raised her right hand up to her face and looked at it. Why not? Did it have to do why? Cancer, Kyrie stated, her words hitting the floor and smashing to pieces. She died when I was young. Kaminari's smile was lost. He looked around the room, his eyes avoiding Kairi. Oh, um, sorry. He stammered though the words, his usual joyful tones gone. No problem, you didn't know. Kairi gave him a half smile. I've been told sorry by a ton of doctors before, so, yeah, you're good. Kaminari gave her a half smile back. I don't have any memories of my mom, but she did leave me two things. Kairi clenched her fist, sparks of bright light arcing around it. This quirk, my body is about one-third lightning Kirin. Kaminari sees the sparks that his classmate is able to produce at a whim, and he looks at his own hand, trying to mimic it. He does succeed with a deal of effort on his part. His attention snapped back to Kairi. What was the other thing she, er, your mom left you? He asked, his toast sitting on his plate, forgotten. My name. Kairi grabs a napkin and writes her name on it. Kairi means beautiful. I looked fucked up even from a young age, so there was no way my mother didn't take notice. According to the doctor who delivered me, the first thing she said was beautiful. Even then, she didn't think anything was wrong. At first sight she saw through my appearance for what I was. Beautiful. Kairi smiled at Kaminari. There were tears in her eyes. He just awkwardly gave her a thumbs up before finally thinking of something to say. Shame she passed. Kaminari smiled at their friend. She sounds like she had what it takes to be a hero. Yeah, yeah. Now then, before we arrive, I want to say a few things. Aizawa's voice filled the bus, drowning out everyone else in Class 1A. They all turned their heads towards their teacher. We are going to the Unforeseen Simulation Joint, or USJ for short. It was built some number of years ago by the Pro Hero 13 as an effort to help train new heroes for disaster situation. I shouldn't have to say this, but treat 13 as you would me. She will be the instructor while we are here. The students all nodded at him, not wanting to disappoint. Oh, and before I forget, All Might will be there. The silent bus was suddenly filled with a resounding what? From its passengers, like Pro Hero All Might. Kaminari asked in disbelief. Yes, Aizawa responded. The number one hero All Might. Hanta questioned. He was looking around the bus to see if anyone else was in on the joke. Yes, him. Aizawa crossed his arms and sighed. He's now faculty at UA. What? Everyone said again, with more vigor this time. Why, sir? Momo asked. Beats me. It might be he decided to try and help out the new heroes. Aizawa sounded tired of the questions. And thankfully for him the USJ was in sight. We're here. No more questions, and get ready to go. We only have a few hours here, and I'm sure the other teachers would get upset to find out you missed class only to ask irrelevant questions. The interior of the USJ was vast. The entire building was a large dome with six distinct zones in it. Each zone's purpose was to stimulate a different disaster in a safe environment. The different zones are as follows, ruins, landslide, mountain, conflagration, flood, and downpour. Waiting for them near the entrance was the spacesuit wearing pro hero. 13. The new class 1A. It's nice to see you all in the flesh. The students could feel a pair of eyes run over them as 13 got a better view of them all. I'm sure Aizawa Sensei here told you about me, and I can't wait to see you all in action. Now before we even think about getting started, I want to tell you something. 13 raised her right hand, pointing up with their index finger. 
My quirk, Black Hole, allows me to destroy potentially anything. However, it can also be used to move rubble blocking my path, put out fires, or stop people from falling. There is no such thing as a villain's quirk. There are only those who cannot see how a quirk can be used for good. 13 waved for everyone to follow. I'll lead you to the locker rooms where you all should get changed into your hero outfits. I'll wait for you all out here. The students all nodded, grabbing the cases that contained their hero attire before rushing into the locker rooms. Well, all except for one. Shiriko Ikioi stayed behind. He sat in his wheelchair and turned to face 13. I'm already suited up. I changed before I left. His voice was cheerful, and his face was smiling at the suited hero. He had spiked gray hair in a small frame. His eyes were a dark yellow, his mouth usually a thin line that quickly changed to a smile when someone looked at him. His eyes looked tired and sunken, like they were much older than the rest of him. His upper body was nothing out of the ordinary for someone his age in the hero course, and his legs were always covered in a sheet. His hero outfit was also peculiar. It consisted of several broken pieces of metal attached to various points of his body. They looked like shrapnel from an explosion. He also carried the hilt of a katana. The blade was broken and the stub was rendered too dull to do any damage. Thirteen approached the boy and put her hand on his shoulder. I read your file before you came here, Shuriko-kun, and I wanted to let you know that you can talk to me if you need help with anything. No one should have to have gone through what you did at your age. She squeezed the boy's arm and he put a hand on hers. Thank you, Thirteen-sensei, but I don't need your help. I think you'll see I'm quite capable. He smiled at the hero, faking his grin even more than usual. I never said I doubted your abilities, Shuriko-kun. She removed her hand from his shoulder. You were waived of doing the physical exam because of outside merits. I'm personally eager to see what you can do. Ikioi cracked a real smile for a moment, before the rest of his class returned from the locker rooms. Thirteen nodded at them and started to lead them to the courtyard in the center of the USJ. Thirteen-san, wait. Aizawa called out, causing everyone to halt. What is it, Aizawa-sensei? Momo questioned. Aizawa's face was one of concern. Something is blocking the signal for my phone. Hearing this caused 13 to glance at their wrist. Mine too. 13 looked at the students. All of you, get back to the exit. What's wrong? Third, Momo started, before the sound of wind rushing by interrupted them. This is the USJ. I thought it would have had more defenses. A raspy male voice from nowhere stated. A dark vortex was swirling around 100 meters away from them. The vortex grew in size and shape. Until a pair of dry hands reached from the vortex and pulled it open farther. A hand attached to a face then came out of the murky darkness of the portal. It was hard to make out the face with the hand in the way. But the two pro heroes could tell the expression the face was making. It was a mix of hatred, disgust, and joy. Hello, heroes. The way the figure said the word heroes was long and drawn out. As if the words were leaving his mouth against his own will. At this point the students understood what was going on. This man was a villain. And as the portal grew in size around him, they knew he wasn't alone. Students, get back. Aizawa shouted, pointing behind him with one hand while putting on his pair of goggles with the other. Run, get out of here. The first wave of villains rushed forward from the portal while he rushed forward towards them. Thirteen, get them to safety. The suited hero nodded, about to turn to face the students when a veil of darkness covered Class 1A. I'm sorry, young ones, but you cannot leave now, a crackly and shifting voice stated. Its origin seemed to be the darkness itself. As soon as the darkness arrived, it vanished, leaving behind only Ikioi, Kaminari, and Tenya in the central plaza. The rest of the students, including Thirteen, were gone. What did you do with them? Tenya demanded. His body moved to an offensive position. Under his helmet, his eyes were snapping around the area, looking for anything. He didn't need to do that for long, however, as he saw dark blobs appear in the various zones. He must have had a warping quirk, Ikioi stated, his hand holding onto the katana hilt tightly. We should get out of here. Aizawa shouted. He was in the middle of fending off several attackers. Find a way to call for help. His scarf was wrapped around several opponents, and he was using it to lead them all into each other, knocking them out. The three students didn't say another word, but started to run for the exit. Tenya was behind Ikioi's wheelchair, pushing him. Momo, Tsuyu, and Kairi fall from a dark portal and land on the deck of a yacht. Momo was the first to run to the railing to get a better view of their current situation, quickly making a pair of binoculars. As she looked over the edge she saw their teacher, Aizawa, fighting multiple opponents while the main villain stood by the portal. She turned to look at the others before looking back, her attention now focused on her immediate vicinity. They were all on a medium-sized yacht floating in the middle of a pool. She could see motion in the water, most likely other villains, she thought to herself. Damn, warping quirks are unfair, Kairi shouted, slamming her fist into the ground. Calm down, Kairi chan Kiro. Suyu said with a smile on her face. Everyone will make it out of this. Suyu offered Kairi her hand to help her up. Kairi sighed before taking it. 
Once everyone was standing, Momo spoke. There are multiple villains in the water. From my estimate, I think it's around eight, at least. She began, her report calm and formal. I think they all have water-related quirks, so if we could get to the shore over there, we might be in the clear. We're too far away from the walls for me to swing with my tongue, Kiro. See you put her finger up to her mouth. Maybe we can move the boat. Excellent idea, Tsu. Momo quickly ran to the control room of the vessel before wandering back out. This is not a real yacht. No controls, so most likely no engine. At that moment the entire boat shook. Boy, either you lot jump down into our arms, or we'll come up there and make you. A cruel voice shouted from below. The three students could hear the sound of plexiglass starting to fracture. Is the water fresh or salt? Kyrie asked, sparks beginning to pop and fizzle around her body. It only took a moment for the others to figure out what she was planning. Most likely no, but, Momo said before running to the edge of the boat. Sue, dangle me from the edge. The frog girl nodded, holding Momo by her legs off the side. Momo then closed her eyes and spread out her arms. NACL. Her mind started to race, activating her quirk took time and effort, but for something this simple it was no problem. Pounds and pounds of table salt erupted from her body, cascading down into the water below. It helped that there was a villain right below her who unknowingly started to spread the salt around by moving out of the way. Boy, what the hell are you lot doing up there? The villain sounded more confused than angry. Kyrie smiled to herself, slowly walking to the edge of the boat. She raised her right hand and looked around her, deep in thought. Nothing metal. Check. Not in pain. Check. Her right middle finger was pressed against her thumb, as if ready to flick. Careful. Only a bit. I only need a tiny, tiny bit. Don't take myself out yet. Momo motioned at Tsuyu, who pulled her up back onto the boat, both quickly covering their ears. 1% lightning, Kairi stated calmly, releasing her middle finger. Her finger started to glow white as it moved through the air. Kairi's right eye glowed brightly for a moment before there was a flash. An arc of white lightning burst forth from her finger. It flew through the air in the direction she flicked, impacting the water and causing a small splash. However, the splash was completely drowned out by the sudden and immense crack of thunder that filled the entire USJ. Thankfully, at 1% the thunder was more of an annoyance than a damaging force. After the thunder died down, Kyrie looked down at the water. Her breathing was heavy, and her hand was sore. She clenched it into a fist and gritted her teeth. As she looked down, she saw every single villain floating face up in the water, unconscious. She turned back to the other two and smiled. Let's get out of here and help the others. She gave them a thumbs up with her left hand. Hanta, Mina, and Thirteen opened their eyes to find themselves in a dark room. Thirteen pressed something on their wrist and a light on their helmet turned on. The suited hero looked around the room, before standing up and moving. Follow me, we're in the ruined zone. Thirteen's words were soft. Her eyes glanced at the two other students, making sure they didn't seem pained as they walked. I know the way out. There were rumbles and creakings. The room that they woke up in was just a mass of concrete and rebar propped up. The entire point of the zone was that it was all falling apart. None of them particularly wanted to spend a lot of time here. Mina and Hanta carefully followed the pro-hero as she navigated throughout the section. The pro tried her best to brighten any uneven flooring to ease the students' travel. The entire time, the pro-hero felt uneasy. Something in the darkness was watching them, following their movements. Thankfully, Thirteen knew the place like the back of her glove, so she was taking a direct route to the exit. The sounds of combat from outside were drowned out by the dome that covered the ruined zone. Small fires and broken buildings were all that the three could see. Thirteen Sensei, wasn't All Might supposed to be here? Mina asked. Both she and Hanta were keeping as close as they could to their guide. He was supposed to be here, Ashido-chan, but I think he's running late. He is the number one hero, so I don't imagine he always has the most free tie. Thirteen suddenly put out her arm, stopping the others from progressing. We have company, use your quirks only for self-defense, and prioritize getting out of here. Thirteen's tone turned more serious. When the two students looked ahead of her, they didn't see anyone standing there, just Thirteen's light illuminating a half-destroyed wall. The rest of the area around them was pitch black. They stood there for a minute or so, a veil of complete silence surrounding them. None of them moved or said anything. Their only motions were gentle, rhythmic breaths. The air grew cold, like a cold wind washed over them. Both Mina and Hanta got goosebumps and started to sweat as the prolonged nothing slowly ate away at their sense of safety. The first to move was Mina. She opened her mouth to speak before something wrapped around her waist and yanked her to the side. Ashido, Hanta yelled, turning towards his classmate as she was beginning to be pulled out of sight. Two lines of tape fired out from his elbows. He didn't think too much about where he was aiming or what to do once he hit the mark. One of the lines flew off into the darkness, while the other hit Mina on the shoulder. She promptly grabbed it with both hands and held on. I got ya, Hanta exclaimed again, grabbing the tape and pulling on it as well. 
At this point, Thirteen turned, shining her light on the pink-skinned student. There was a large tentacle wrapped around her waist. It looked like it was made out of a congealed liquid, and it was a murky black in color. As the light shone on the tentacle, the color changed from black to a darker gray. Mina shut her eyes in pain as the tentacle constricted around her. Take this, Mina screamed, creating a thick acid around her waist. The tentacle jolted back in pain and quickly let go of her, hastily moving back into the darkness around the corner, vanishing from view. Mina stumbled up to Thirteen and Hanta, her arm around her waist. She grit her teeth. I'm good, it's just a bit sore. We need to get out of here, Hanta says, turning to Thirteen. Do you have any more lights? Thirteen shook her head in response. Not on me, but there should be some more in a box nearby. You think that thing is weak to light, Hanta Kun? Mina asks, shaking off the pain. The other student nodded. Geez, it's like an alien, Mina exclaimed. Both Hanta and Thirteen looked at her with a confused expression. Like the aliens from Alien. They pounce from nowhere and eat you. Mina slashed the air and hissed, trying to do her best impression of an alien. Both Thirteen and Hanta shook their heads at her before Thirteen looked out into the darkness. I hope they're the only villain here. You two have already proved you can deal with them. Thirteen stated, trying to build the student's faith in the situation. Let's keep moving, and next time I say there's someone, you two stay put. I think their quirk only sees through movement. Both of the students nodded as the group turned to continue walking. All of them failed to notice the large mass of darkness several meters behind them. It slowly followed, waiting for the ideal moment to strike. Todoroki Shoto didn't need assistance. He, Ijiro, and Toru all ended up in the landslide zone. Upon being accosted by villains, Shoto simply told the others to stay back as he froze all of them. His breath was visible, specks of frost on his body. This is the invasion force, he began, walking up to one of the newly created statues. This wasn't even a challenge. Sloppy, he put his right hand near the frozen villain's head. Tell me, what is your plan? I don't intend to kill any of you, but one can live with frostbite. The villain swallowed. There was only a first-year high school student in front of him, but he saw a cold ferocity in the boy's eyes. Ijiro and Toru stood back, both of them looking at each other before turning back to Shoto. Well, the two-toned kid asked again. Shigaraki stood by the dark portal, his arms outstretched, as more villains kept emerging from it. Isn't this fun, Kirajiri? The head villain spoke excitedly, almost sounding like a kid on Christmas. But I'm still not happy. He snarled, stomping his foot down. Where's All Might? He shouted loudly, his dry voice filling the courtyard before being drowned out by the crack of thunder. Some of the villains looked over at the flash, giving Aizawa time to take them out easily. He didn't need to look over, for he already knew who caused it. The class is still green, but they're damn strong. I still need to finish this as soon as possible. He shrugged away his thoughts to focus on the fight. Tenya, Kaminari, and Ikioi were already across the courtyard when they heard the thunder. Their eyes glanced over at the yacht before returning to the area in front of them. I hope Kairi san is alright, Tenya said, trying to stay focused on escaping. His duty as the class representative was urging him to go and help. But that's not what his teacher had told him. She'll be fine, Kaminari smiled at him. She's built tough. And besides, we need to call for help. Both Tenya and Ikioi nodded at him before they all ground to a sudden halt. Blocking the staircase and elevator up was a large stone wall. Tenya was planning on carrying Ikioi up to save time. But now it appeared that their plans had changed completely. The ground beneath them shook, a low rumble at first, before it felt as if the ground itself would be torn asunder. Class 1A, a deep, growling voice stated. It sounded as if the ground itself was making the noise. I applied to UA way back when, but was denied. Stalagmites started to jut up from the ground, blocking the way the students had come. Then when I found out that Cementos got in, I lost it. The wall of rock blocking the stairs shook and warped, large chunks breaking away and flying directly towards the student. Tenya took evasive actions, moving Ikioi out of the way as Kaminari dived down, the rocks flying above him. The boss told us we should try to kill a few of you to make a point. The wall that broke apart started to repair itself, pieces of rock filling the gaps of what was thrown. I'd gladly do it, you UA bastards. As the wall shifted and shook again, Tenya's legs tensed. He was ready to dodge when Ikioi held up his hand. A large boulder that was at least two meters across erupted from the wall and headed straight for Ikioi and Tenya. There was a blur of motion mixed with the sound of a blade hitting stone. The boulder split cleanly in two, air quickly rushing in to fill the newly formed gap. Each piece flew past the two students and slammed into the stalagmites behind them. Ikioi's hand was outstretched as he looked forward. His once dark eyes were now burning a blazing yellow. In his hand was the hilt of the katana, but unlike before, there was a blade attached to it. The blade itself looked as if it was glowing, and it was covered in fracture marks. Ikioi flipped the blade around and stabbed the ground with it, putting his weight on it as he threw his blanket aside. There was the sound of gears and springs moving as he stood up. 
There were what appeared to be braces attached to his legs. They looked bulky, but the way they moved was elegant and smooth. Once Akioi was at full stature, he pulled the sword out from the ground, swinging it in front of him. Ada Kun, please count five minutes, and tell me when I don't have much time left. I don't want to get lost in the moment again. Ikioi's voice held determination and resolve. The air around him shifted as he was enveloped in a golden aura. When the light faded, it left behind an entire suit of armor. Ikioi was dressed from his head to his feet in what looked like traditional samurai armor. It was a dark, metallic color with gears and springs packed everywhere inside of it. As for his helmet, it encircled his head and had two wrenches coming off the side of it as horns. My name is Shuriko Ikioi and you, villain, who have threatened the thing I hold dearest, shall fall to my hands. The air stood still for a moment. Both Ikioi and the villain were motionless. As the ground beneath Tenya started to crack, he dove to the side as a large hand made of rock emerged from the ground. Each one of its fingers was around two meters in length, and it motioned to slam down onto the ground on top of Tenya. Ikioi turned his head, his eyes locking onto it. His legs spun around, as if on wheels, before Ikioi crouched down. There was a loud bang as Ikioi hurtled forward, his sword held at his hip. He reached the hand in around half a second, the world around him an undefined blur, save for the hand. Ikioi's mind was racing. His heart was beating faster than it had ever been. He examined the hand. It was rough and uneven, but Ikioi turned his attention to the joint between the thumb and the fingers. There, he screamed in his mind. Tenya hardly had the time to fully acknowledge the hand appearing let alone attempting to crush him as it suddenly stopped moving. The fingers slid down toward him while the palm started to move away. Tenya kicked away the fingers, and he saw Ikuai standing with his face scrunched up into a scowl. The wrist stub started to move away from them, as if running, before Ikuai turned. It was a motion as fluid as it was fast. His sword struck the ground on the other side of the stump. The rock cracked into multiple pieces from the clean line that had just been cut through it, as what was left of the stump crumbled away. Ikuai shouted, Reveal yourself. Hiding in cowardice behind one's quirk is undignified. Let us spar, villain. Several meters from Ikioi the ground ruptured, a pillar bursting upwards. It was almost ten meters tall, and on top of the pillar was a figure covered in rocks and stones. It looked like they were integrated into his body. I'll kill you, you UA brat. The figure shouted, staring down at the armored boy. Kairi, Momo, and Tsuyu stood on top of the yacht. Momo and Tsuyu looked over the edge at the multiple villains floating in the water. Kairi was holding her right arm in her left hand. An occasional winds of pain crossed her face before she pushed it away. We should be good, I don't see any more movement, Momo stated, turning towards Tsuyu. Can you handle the salt, Tsu? I didn't think about that until now. Tsuyu thought for a moment. I should be fine. I requested my suit be able to help me in salt and water, Kiro. Tsuyu responded, giving Momo a smile. What about you, Kairi chan Kairi grit her teeth at Tsuyu, trying to smile. I feel fine, my hand is just tingling. It should stop soon, Kairi replied, looking over the edge of the boat at the water. I just don't know if I can swim right now. Momo noticed that her right leg was twitching, and she hadn't moved it at all since she shocked the water. It's okay, Kiro. I can carry you, Kairi chan Suyu said, stepping towards her friend. Thank you, Su. Kairi said, feeling her hand twitch. I need to get better at using my quirk. Kairi muttered to herself. She shook her head and gripped the railing tightly. Let's go. I'm sure the others could use our help. Momo hit the water with a splash, quickly swimming to shore. Kairi and Tsuyu shortly followed her. Upon leaving the water and walking up a small hill to return to the courtyard, they froze at the sight that greeted them. In the distance, they saw a wall of stalagmites blocking the stairs out of the USJ, but less than 30 meters from where they stood was Aizawa with his head shoved into the ground. The creature holding him down was massive, almost twice the height of a normal person, with what appeared to be an exposed brain and a bird-like face. Standing next to it was Shigaraki who was clapping and shifting his feet happily. Good job, Namu. You did very well the lead villain sang, or rather, tried to sing. All that came out of his mouth was a raspy drawl. The beast let forth a roar. It sounded as grotesque as it looked, as if the sound itself was misshapen. Kairi had her right arm extended. Her eyes were filled with a rage and it burned like wildfire. She had two fingers ready to flick, sparks arcing around her. Her mind didn't stop to think of the consequences of what she was going to do. She needed to help, to save her teacher. As her right eye suddenly blazed a blinding white, Momo and Tsuyu finally noticed what was happening to their friend. Momo knew there was no stopping Kairi in this moment, so she grabbed Tsuyu and quickly dove down into the water. Just as the two got under the waves did a thought cross the mind of Kairi. 13% lightning. 13. Hanta. And Mina made a bit of progress out of the ruined zone. Whatever villain had attacked them before seemed to have backed off for the time being. Currently, they were outside of a ruined building. It looked like your average street in a Japanese city, except the place was in complete disrepair. There were run-down cars and small fires everywhere as well. 
There's several exits to this place. One should be down this street, 13 said plainly, before looking down at her wrist. This is not good. Do you kids have any communication devices? Hunter reached into his pocket and pulled out his phone. Does it have a signal? No, huh, not even Wi-Fi. Hanta scrolled through his phone settings. Not even GPS. 13 sighed, moving their wrist back to their side. That's what I thought. This is distressing. 13 tried to hide the extent of their concern. This is more than simple signal blocking. This is a complete shutoff from the outside world, and even the inside one as well. I'm not getting a signal from the control room either, so I can't check the status of any of the zones. 13 walked over to a nearby car and forced the trunk open. Luckily, my memory is still fully functional. Inside the trunk was a keyboard and screen, as well as a flashlight. Here, Ashido-kun, take this. She grabbed the flashlight and tossed it to Mina. Keep watch for me. I'm going to try to check the status of everyone. Yes, sensei. Mina turned to face the empty street. The light didn't seem to travel as far as it should have. The darkness seemed to surround them like wolves cornering their prey. Mina's left hand was rubbing her waist. You okay, Ashido-chan? Hanta asked, trying to look around. He was poised and ready to strike. Mina nodded her head. Mm him. I just was squeezed a bit too tightly. Mina stretched for a moment, before adopting a pose of her own. I'll be just fine though. Mina was interrupted by the roar of lightning. There was the sound of some of the smaller buildings collapsing. What? What was that? Thirteen asked, before staring at the screen. Oh, oh heavens. Kadachi-san. Both Hanta and Mina looked at the screen. It was a wired security feed. It showed Kairi, the ground around her scorched black with burns. The water near her was choppy and filled with waves. Kairi shifted back and forth on her feet before completely freezing in place. The picture quality wasn't the best, but the three viewers could still tell that there were black spots on the left half of her body. Unfortunately for our viewers, they all were looking at the screen and forgot about something crucial, their own surroundings. Thirteen let out a shout of surprise as multiple pairs of hands grabbed her lower legs. The hand started to move away, dragging Thirteen off into the darkness. Mina shined the light at Thirteen, and Hanta shot tape at her. The hands pushed Thirteen's head to the ground, where the darkness leapt from the ground and covered her flashlight, rendering it unusable. Just as the hands holding Thirteen were starting to turn gray, there was a bang. Both Mina and Hanta covered their ears in response, but the bullet that was already let loose flew through the air and hit the flashlight Mina was holding. In an instant, the entire place was cast into pitch darkness. The two students didn't hear the sound of Thirteen thrashing against her captor, nor the sounds of the ruined zone anymore. A deep silence permeated their beings. Good, an unknown, androgynous voice stated. It was calm and collected, but sounded like a roar in comparison to complete hush the students had just experienced. Now that I finally have you two here, my work is complete. The voice was posh and refined. It almost had a friendly aspect to it. Welcome to my room. And sorry about the darkness, but I merely prefer it this way. I don't intend to keep you here long, just until Shigaraki-sama gives the order to leave. Hanta tried to walk in the direction of Mina, and Mina in the direction of Hanta. Both found themselves not crossing paths with the other. They tried to call out, but no sound came from their mouths. The sounds of a vile chuckle echoed in the infinite darkness. You might as well sit down and wait at this rate. I swear that I won't hurt you if you don't move around. I just need to get this pro under tighter lockdown, and I will have earned my pay. The voice said, their tone taking one of mockery. Both Hanta and Mina sat down. Not even the sounds of their own heartbeats were audible. Hanta laid down. He was never afraid of the dark, but this was much more severe than he was accustomed to. He rolled onto his side, hoping to catch a glimpse of something, anything, but no, just darkness in all directions. He was going to close his eyes in defeat when he felt something in his pocket, his phone. An idea popped into his head. It was nonsense, but so was this quirk. He pulled out the phone, ready to enact his plan while hoping with all his being that it would work. Your plan is to try and kill All Might. Shoto wanted confirmation. The frozen villain in front of him weakly nodded. Shoto turned away from him to face Ijiro and Toru. Kirishima-san, Hagakir-san. We should head back down and report this. Ijiro faced Toru to nod at her before a sudden large bang rocked the building. They all ran to a nearby cliff face and peered over it. Their eyes were drawn to a large beast-like creature. Black smoke was billowing from it, a large column extending up to the domed ceiling. Within seconds the smoke stopped and started to clear. The beast let out a large roar. It was hard to see from the student's vantage point, but there wasn't a scratch on it. Given that bang, that sounded like one of Kairi's larger blasts. Ajiro shouted, That thing looks like it hasn't taken a bit of damage. Their eyes moved over to see Kairi frozen stiff, with Momo and Tsuyu climbing out of the water nearby. We need to get down there, Tori replied. The three students started to climb down the cliffs to get to the others. Ikioi stood at the bottom of the quickly erected stone pillar. 
The villain, nearly frothing at the mouth, stood atop it. He loomed over the students. Kaminari was stunned with shock while Tenure rushed up to Ikioi's side. We need to get out of here, he exclaimed to Ikioi. Surely you can just cut down the wall and we can move on. He was motioning between Ikioi's sword and the wall. We need to get out of here and call for help, like Aizawa sensei said. Ikioi stood there for a moment before speaking. His voice was resolute and firm. How much time do I have left? He questioned. Tenya let out an exasperated groan. You have almost three minutes, but I don't see how that changes our situation. Tenya shook his head as Ikioi gripped his sword tighter. Before he could respond, several large rocks flew down from the top of the pillar. Ikioi chopped down the ones near him while Tenya moved out of the way. Let's just go, Shuriko-kun. Tenya shouted. Ikioi screamed. It was an expression of frustration and anger. Tenya had heard him scream like this before. In fact, the entire class had. Ikioi rushed up to the pillar and started to swing fiercely at it. His blade smoothly chopped through it like butter. His entire body was moving with a careful dedication to the art of wielding a katana. In seconds, the pillar was already half as tall as it was before. The villain perched on top of it jumped off. He was propelled by a rock suddenly jutting out from the top. You won't get me that easily, he exclaimed, before laughing. He aimed headfirst towards the ground. Before he could reach it, Tenya suddenly rocketed forward, the sound of his engines roaring to life as he rushed to the villain's landing point, kneeing him in the gut before he landed. The villain coughed before collapsing on the ground. Tenya whipped his head to Ikioi. There, the problem has been resolved. Now let us go. Please, we need to call for help. Tenya rushed back to Kaminari and Ikioi. But he stopped in his tracks as the sound of an explosion shook the ground. What was that? Kaminari rushed to the stalagmite wall. That had to be Kairi san Kaminari punched the wall. Quick, Shuriko-kun, take this down. If she used this kind of force, then we need to make sure she's okay. No, we need to do what Aizawa-sensei told us to and get help. Tenya begged, trying to reason with his classmates. Ikioi felt a hand grab his shoulder. He pushed it away and flipped around, sword at the ready. He almost dropped the sword at the sight he saw. The man, or rather, the pro hero towering in front of him was one that he had never thought he would see this close before. Tenya started to stutter, unable to find words, while Kaminari's jaw dropped. What's this about help? The hero asked, the smile on his face growing in intensity. Kairi's limbs had locked up, she was stuck standing upright. Her breathing was heavy and labored, and her entire body was sore. Every movement hurt and her lungs burned. She had gone far beyond her current limit. Her right arm remained outstretched, held up by her left. Her left hand was severely burned, while the left side of her body was looking worse for wear. At this point, smoke was still streaming out of the creature she had blasted. I, I did it, she said to herself. Momo and Tsuyu crawled out of the water. You need to warn us next time. Momo yelled at Kairi. She hadn't actually seen the condition that Kairi was in yet. If I didn't jump in the water, then you might have blown. Out. Our. Eardrums. The power behind Momo's words died as she saw Kairi. Tsuyu went to pick up Kairi before Momo shouted at her. Don't touch her. She could still be charged. Tsuyu stopped, taking a step back. Both Momo's and Tsuyu's heads turned towards the black smoke as the sound of clapping started. I need to congratulate you, a raspy voice said. You've done better than I could have imagined for a bunch of children. You almost destroyed Namu in one go. The smoke stopped flowing forth and the students got a good look at the creature that had their teacher pin. It looked completely fine, but that wasn't enough. Shigaraki cackled as if he heard a really good joke. But don't look so sad. For giving it an honest effort, I'll give you a consolation prize. He reached out a hand for Aizawa's leg. I'll kill your annoying teacher. Shigaraki's hand was moving towards Aizawa at what seemed like slow motion for Momo and Tsuyu. Both of them were still stunned by the fact that even through the blast the creature was unharmed. They did notice, however, a blur moving towards the villain. When Shigaraki started to close his grasp around their teacher's leg, his hand went straight through it. What? He muttered to himself, opening his hand and trying again, with the same result. What? He exclaimed, annoyance and anger building. I won't let you kill Sensei. A voice from behind him called out. Shigaraki whipped his head around to see a Fudo, his hand lightly touching him. A hero protects those they care about. Shigaraki spun, moving his hands towards the student. Fudo closed his eyes tightly as the villain's hands phased through him. He opened them, a small smile on his face. I did it, he thought to himself. He grabbed the scarf around his neck, pulling it off so he was holding it. When Shigaraki tried to lunge for him again he backstepped and flicked the scarf out. It wrapped around the villain's wrist. As long as I have you, I won't let you hurt anyone. Fudo shouted, his voice filled with enthusiasm. Then I'll have to kill you first, Brad. Shigaraki went to lunge at the boy before one of the stalagmites that made up the wall flew at them and phased through them both. They turned their heads to look at the source. Standing around 100 meters away was a man with a white button-up shirt and yellow striped pants. He was large and tall, his muscles seemed too big for anyone to have. 
His smile ignited hope, and both Shigaraki and Fudo recognized him instantly. There's no need to fear, students. His booming voice filled the entire area. For I am here. All Might needed to retire. That's why he was at UA to begin with. He needed to find a successor for one for all. And he wanted to look over the current student body to find someone. Principal Nezu had found a possible candidate for the new quirk, a student by the name of Mirio. But All Might decided to look at all of the students before choosing who would get one for all, since he was injured to the brink of death. Everyone who knew the secret of one for all had been urging All Might to make the decision soon. It was ten minutes before class had started, and All Might was about to leave to go to the USJ when Principal Nezu had pulled him aside to talk to him in the teacher's lounge. You need to find a successor soon, All Might, Principal Nezu stated. He was sitting across from the hero. I know, I know, the hero responded, scratching the back of his head, his eyes avoiding the animal's gaze. All Might was currently in his weakened form, his bony hands clasped together. I'm not saying that is a need for one for all, but as your friend, Nezu took a sip from his cup of tea. You look even weaker than you usually do, and I fear for what will happen when you're out at work. The hero sighed, realizing that Nezu was correct. As the days wore on, it was getting harder and harder to maintain his muscled form. I just don't want to decide immediately. What if I choose preemptively? I don't want to make the wrong choice. All Might didn't want to pass on the power, not yet. As much as he wanted to pass the torch, there was still so much work that needed to be done. The world still needed the symbol of peace and he didn't want to abandon it. All right, All Might, but I will ask something of you. What is it, Sensei? Please choose someone by the end of the year. If you can't find someone, you can always go with Tagata-kun. Nezu had set down his cup of tea and stared at his old friend. All Might let out a heavy and long sigh. All right, Sensei. All Might shifted his gaze down to his hands. I agree. If I don't find a successor, I'll give it to your suggestion. Nezu smiled at All Might's response. Excellent. Nezu's beady eyes turned to the clock. Oh dear. It appears we've been talking for a while. All Might checked his watch, an expression of shock on his face. Oh, you're right, I'm late to go talk about rescue operations. He pulled his phone out from his pocket. Let me give 13 Sen a call and tell her I'll be right there. After he dialed the number he put the phone up to his ear. It didn't even ring once before the call failed. That's odd, HMMMM. Sensei, who's at the USJ today? Is it class O or B? If I recall correctly, it's Class 1A, the one that Aizawa Kun teaches. Both Nezu and All Might's faces turned to concern as they started to piece together the situation. As All Might tried and failed to call Aizawa, he stood up. The racer head never forgets to charge his phone, never. All Might started to walk over to the window, his muscles growing under his suit. Send some backup. I think something's happening at the USJ. Before Nezu could say another word. All Might jumped out of the window, rocketing off into the distance. All Might stood around 100 meters away from Shigaraki and Fudo. Their eyes were locked onto him, his presence oozing courage and hope. Each step he took caused the ground to crack under his weight, and he strode forward, confident. How treacherous for villains to attack mere students, All Might stated, now standing only several meters away from the Namu holding Aizawa down. Looks like you'll need to be taught a lesson yourselves. All Might cracked his knuckles together. The sound echoed in the large dome. Shigaraki started to laugh hysterically, before shouting, Namu, that's him, kill him, destroy him. Shigaraki was shaking with excitement and Fudo used this opportunity to dash over to the injured Aizawa, using his quirk on him. Fudo started to drag him away, getting him to safety. As Fudo looked back he could see the beast, beaked Ma open and shrieking, charging towards All Might. The moment Namu stepped within range, All Might struck it with a firm punch, his fist digging into its face. However, much to everyone's surprise, the creature didn't even flinch or react to the strike. It simply got closer and punched All Might, sending him several feet backward. All Might furrowed his brow as he stomped his foot on the ground before rushing the creature, grabbing it by the waist and bending backwards to suplex it. Hitting the ground with a thud, the creature was embedded into it, the concrete floor cracking and being pushed aside by the sheer force. All Might stood and turned to face Shigaraki. Now then, are you the next evildoer I need to take care of? He said, cracking his knuckles again. Heh. <laughs> Shigaraki started to laugh. Ha 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 His laugh transformed into a cackle. My name is Tamura, Shigaraki Tamura. He took a step closer to All Might. Even though his face was covered All Might could sense his bloodlust. You are going to die, number one hero All Might. All Might's smile simply grew brighter in response. Many people have tried in the past, but none have succeeded. What makes you think it will go differently for you? Because, Shigaraki began, before snapping his fingers. You're a fool if you think that's all Namu's got. All Might whipped around, turning to face the body that he had embedded into the floor. All that was there was the crater. All Might started to look around trying to figure out where it went before something heavy suddenly landed on top of him, forcing him to the ground. 
The Namu was on his back, pinning him to the floor. Shigaraki started to walk towards the pro hero, the fingers on his right hand twitching excitedly. I wonder if you'll scream as you decay. His voice sounded cold, but excited. He was soon a foot away from them. All Might tried his hardest to resist. But as much as he pushed, the creature didn't seem to budge at all. Hanta held his phone tightly while standing in an area of pure darkness. Mina and Thirteen needed his help, and he refused to let anything stand in his way of helping them. He pushed the lock button on his phone and the screen turned on, a bright light shining in the darkness. He quickly turned on the phone's flashlight. It seemed like the darkness around him started to shift and warp, turning a shade of dark gray. He bolted forwards. The edges of darkness seemingly tried to move away from him, but couldn't move fast enough. When he reached the wall, he punched it and tore through it like paper. He fell down, his feet suddenly hitting the ground, and landed in an unknown part of the ruined zone. He looked back at his previous prison. It was a sphere of darkness. Its diameter was around 3 meters, and it had a newly added hole on the side. He then looked around the room he was in. It looked like a mostly intact parking garage. He shined the light around, before finding what he was looking for, another two dark spheres. He broke into a sprint to reach them. Before he could, a voice called out to him, and he stopped in his tracks. Youth these days, always having their phones on them. It was the same androgynous voice from before, except now he could see the person to whom it belonged. They wore a black tailcoat with matching black dress pants. They had a grey button-down shirt and a black top hat completed their outfit. When Hanta tried to look at their face, he realized that they were wearing a dark mask. Who are you? Hanta asked, half expecting to not receive an answer from the villain. My name is Yatashi Zami, and it would be in your best interest to put the phone away before things have to get painful for people, the stranger said, clasping their hands together hopefully. Hanta refused to back down, slowly approaching Yatashi. Fine then. You caused this pain. Yatashi snapped their fingers and one of the spheres shifted, shrinking down and rising up from the ground. Once it was just big enough to hold a person, the bottom of it opened, and Thirteen popped out. She didn't touch the ground, however, as she was being held up by several dark tendrils. One of them was wrapping tightly around her right arm, holding her index finger against her head. This was preventing her from utilizing her quirk. You let them go, Hanta shouted, holding out his phone with one hand while readying his tape shooter with the other. Get back in the bubble, boy. Itashi stated firmly. If you cooperate, then no one needs to get hurt. I'm here to contain 13, and contain them I will. Hanta squeezed his phone again. I will save them. He responded, continuing to step forward. I won't let you do this to 13 or my friend. I'll defeat you if I have to. Shigaraki reached down towards All Might's leg, his long, dry fingers twitching as they wrapped around the pro hero's ankle. Before he could wrap his pinky around it, the air became frigid. Shigaraki pulled his hand away and leapt backward as a wall of jagged ice erupted from the ground. It trailed from where All Might lay several feet away to its source, a bent over Shoto, hand put firmly on the ground. He will not hurt anyone else, Shoto stated, getting up to walk over towards the villain. Kirishima-kun, make sure Kairi is okay. Anjiro nodded his head, not exactly wanting to take orders from his classmate but doing so anyways. What makes you act so high and mighty, brat? Shigaraki said, spitting out his words at the kid. In times of crisis, it is vital for someone to take charge. Shoto clenched his fists together and exhaled. His breath was visible. Now don't distract me. I want this to be done quickly. He raised his right hand, ice forming at his fingertips. Before a wave of cold burst forth, moving quickly and freezing everything in its path, the wall of ice quickly approached Shigaraki, who didn't even make an effort to dodge it. After the spot he was standing in was completely overtaken with ice, Shoto put his hand down and started to breathe heavily. His body had patches of ice on it and parts of his skin were discolored. He started to walk over to where All Might was when he heard an insidious laugh coming from beside the ice wall. Good work, Kirajiri. You managed to stop a brat's attack successfully this time, Shigaraki stated, walking out from behind the wall. I'm sorry, Shigaraki-sama, an unknown voice replied. It seemed to be coming from behind the wall as well. It sounded hollow and seemed to echo. The other student was all but invisible before they touched you. Shigaraki shook his head before shaking his hands. Either way, he pointed a dry finger at Shoto. Ready for a game over, brat? Hanta dashed forward at Yatashi, shooting tape to his right to dodge an incoming tentacle attack. He had received some combat training in his first week, and he already could move around with his tape pretty well. Yatashi flicked their wrist, sending another wave of tentacles at Hanta. Moving with his tape again, he shifted back to where he was standing before. After the initial dash, he hadn't managed to gain any ground, and Yatashi wanted to keep it this way. Please just surrender already, Yatashi asked, holding out their hand as if to make a deal. I won't hurt Thirteen or your friend. Just, please, get back in the bubble. Their voice sounded stern and demanding, but also, in a way, begging. Hanta examined Yatashi again. 
Something was off. Wait, Hanta began, shining his light in front of him at Yatashi while walking forward. You're bluffing. Each step he took was determined. He didn't waver at all. I think I figured out a limitation of your quirk. Hanta was now only several feet away from Yatashi. I don't think you can harm me when I have the light. Not when it's pointed at you. The villain grit their teeth. So, you gonna let my friends go? The two people stared at each other for a few moments. And if I refuse? Yatashi asked, crossing their arms. Hanta froze for a moment, not expecting them to actually call his own bluff. Uh, well, I could, or maybe. Hanta never imagined himself in this situation, bargaining with a villain. Oh, I know. Yatashi raised an eyebrow at the student's idea. They opened their mouth to speak before Hanta shot out tape and quickly dashed around them, wrapping them tightly. He then secured his phone with tape, having it dangle from the ceiling, and left it pointed at the villain. Duh, I could just bind you, Hanta said to himself, lightly chuckling. Ajiro reached Kairi, Momo, and Tsuyu, the latter two trying to figure out how to handle Kairi. Is she okay? Ajiro asked, reaching out to try and touch the paralyzed Kairi. Careful, Kirishima-kun. She might still be highly charged, Momo stated, grabbing Ijiro's arm to stop him from touching her. We need to get her to a safe place. She hasn't said or done anything since she fired the bolt. I think she shocked her system. Momo frowned, a look of concern on her face. Could you make a stretcher, yay Arazu chan Suyu asked, putting her finger to her mouth to think. Momo nodded. I could, but it would be tricky to get her on it. Momo sighed, sitting down on a nearby rock. After a moment she raised her head to look at Ijiro. Wait, when you harden, don't you get resistant to electricity? Momo asked the redhead. Uh, slightly, I guess. I haven't done a lot of training. He gave Momo a smile, keeping up his confidence. Take these, Momo said, producing a pair of thick gloves. They provide some shock absorption, and combined with your hardening, should allow you to pick up and carry Kairi san Ijiro put his fists together. All right, I'll do the manly thing and carry my friend to safety. Ikoi, Tenya, and Kaminari were standing near the entrance to the USJ. After All Might had reached them, they explained the situation to him. He had told them to wait near the entrance, and that they had done a good job. I want to be down there, being a hero, instead of waiting near the door. Ikoi stated, he still had his armor on, and he stuck his sword into the ground, frustrated. You heard All Might, Shuriko-kun, Tenya began. We need to stay out of the way and out of danger. We shouldn't put ourselves in harm's way while the pros do their work. Besides dude, wasn't it cool talking to All Might? Kaminari yelled. He was pumping his fists with excitement. Not every day you meet the number one hero. Ikioi rolled his eyes and sighed in frustration. Could you bring me my chair, Itakun? He asked. The glow that previously surrounded his armor was starting to fade. I'm just gonna turn this off. When Tenya brought him the chair he slumped down into it, the armor around his body fading away as well as the sword's blade. I just wish I could do more. He thought to himself. I don't want to let them down, never again. This fight was not as straightforward as Shoto hoped it would be. What he thought would be a simple freezing of the villain quickly turned into a fight for his life. With the dark warp gate villain shifting and moving around Shigaraki's hands, Shoto had to focus entirely on defense, creating ice barriers where he could to stop the onslaught. Every once in a while, he could hear All Might groan, trying to break free from Namu's grasp. If you abandon Quest, I'll give you a painless death, Shigaraki shouted, lunging again at Shoto. He tried to jump back, only to find himself jumping right into a warp gate appearing directly in front of Shigaraki. It didn't help that Shoto was feeling the negative effects of his ice quirk. His body temperature was dropping quickly, and without wanting to use his fire quirk, there was only so much the heaters in his costume could do to mitigate it. As Shigaraki reached out for Shoto, he created another ice wall. He could feel his heart starting to slow down, and his mind grow foggy. He looked over at All Might. The pro hero was completely outdone by one villain. Is this the end of All Might? He thought to himself. No, it can't be. I have to save him. He could feel heat rising in his left hand. I refuse to use this power, his power, but he hates All Might. Shoto raised his hand, a red glow in his palm. So now, father, save the hero you hate the most. A torrent of flames shot forth from Shoto's hand, partially melting the ice wall. The flames reached Namu, who cried out in shock as its arms started to melt. Since Shoto was extremely cold, his body was overproducing heat to make up for it. All Might could feel Namu's limbs liquefying as he suddenly pushed upwards and threw off Namu. All Might used this chance to get back on his feet and punch Namu in the chest before he reached the ground. The beast stayed there in midair. Since one punch didn't seem to do much, how about a hundred? All Might shouted before releasing a barrage of blows to the bloated beast. All Might counted each punch in his head, making sure to keep his promise. Once he had completed 99 punches, he pulled his arm back. Detroit. Smash. His voice filled the USJ as his fist impacted Namu one final time. The beast suddenly exploded backwards, rocketing out of the area and breaking through the glass dome. 
All Might was panting as he turned to face Shigaraki. Who's next? Hanta grabbed Thirteen's arm and pulled it down, breaking it free from the grasp of the tendrils. She pointed it above herself and used her quirk to suck up the darkness. Once free, she stood up and bowed at Hanta. Thank you for saving me, Siro kun You did a good job, Thirteen said, turning to face the other orb of darkness. Watch the villain while I free Ashido-chan. Hanta nodded his head, moving over to the wrapped-up villain. Why didn't you try to shoot me? He asked them, standing a meter or so away from the villain. Hem, Yatashi looked up at the boy, before shaking their head. I wasn't paid enough to kill anyone, let alone a child. So you're a hired villain? Hanta raised his eyebrow, curious at the job that this villain had. One could say that. Yatashi sighed, looking at the ground. I do wish that I went down a different path though. Before Hanta could give a response he felt a hand on his shoulder. Don't listen to him, he's a villain. Thirteen whispered. Hanta could see Mina standing behind her. Hey, since when did I say I was male? Yatashi shouted. I'm darkness. Darkness has no gender. Yatashi squirmed in their binds, the bright light of the phone still shining on them. Thirteen turned away from them to look at Mina. You feeling alright? She asked the pink girl. Mina nodded her head. Thank you for getting me out of there, Thirteen Sensei. Mina bowed at her teacher. Actually, Siro Kun was the one who saved me, so you should be thanking him. Oh, well then. She walked past Thirteen and stood in front of Hanta. Thanks for being a hero, tape boy. She smiled. Hanta chuckled nervously, scratching the back of his head. And no problem, he replied, letting out a nervous chuckle. But, uh, Thirteen Sensei, how do we get out of here? Shigaraki started to scratch at his neck. This was not what he had planned. He could feel his nails tearing away at flesh, digging deeper and deeper. How, how dare you remove Namu from play? Shigaraki's voice was even drier than usual. His entire body shook when he spoke. Ew, ew. He was at a loss for words. Kurajiri, we're leaving. Shoto and All Might both look surprised. We need to replan. Shigaraki turned, a dark vortex opening behind him. All Might leapt forward, arm outstretched to grab the escaping villain. Another vortex opened in front of him, and he found his arm jutting out in a random direction away from Shigaraki. So you're just here to do damage and leave? Shoto asked, his eyes boring into Shigaraki's back. This was a blitz, but we lost our best player, so yeah, we're leaving. Before Shigaraki fully stepped through the portal, he turned, scowling with anger. I will kill you, All Might. I will turn to dust all you hold dear as well. And just as quickly as the raid started, it was over. Lessons didn't resume for Class 1 of that day. They soon found themselves swarmed by police and several pro heroes from UA. Thankfully, it seemed that the only student who was hurt was Kairi, who had electrical burns. Shoto needed to be warmed back up, but nothing he wasn't used to. While the leader successfully got away, quite a large number of the other villains did not. All those in the flood and mountain zones were captured. However, Yatashi evaded arrest. Kurajiri had opened gates at several different locations, trying to pick up as many of the accomplices as possible. The great hero All Might, or rather, Tashinori sat in the passenger's seat of a police cruiser. Tsukachi-san, I thought you were working another case. Tashinori asked the detective sitting in the driver's seat. They each had a cup of coffee in hand. The detective shook his head. I was, but I'm always up to making sure my friends are alright. He took a sip from the cup. Besides, I needed to get out of that office. The detective picked up his notebook and looked over it again. None of the students had any real injuries. Well, besides one. Yeah, Kadachi-chan. Tashinori looked out the window at the students talking to the police. Her quirk reminds me of mine, in a way. Great power, but with a cost. I've heard rumors of the Kirin quirks, but I never thought a student at UA would have won. UA teaches the best of the best, right? So it makes sense that eventually one would show up. You would think, but the last I've heard, none of them lived in Japan. They all left. Hmm. Sukachi put his hand to his chin. Either way, Tashinori-san, I have a favor to ask. The blonde-haired hero looked at him. Sure, what is it? I want you to look into all of the first years. I have a gut feeling like that's the age that the Grand Master is. I want to make sure they aren't someone at UA. Tashinori hesitated for a moment, before nodding his head. Of course, anything for an old friend. Tell me again how you saved Sensei. Momo asked Fudo. They were both standing outside of the USJ, waiting for the bus to take them back to UA. I saw you just suddenly appear behind the villain, so what happened? Fudo was quiet, fiddling with his fingers. I, well, when the darkness appeared, Fudo began, I stood there, frozen. But I think my quirk activated, and I just, well I mean, I think I just phased through the portal. Fudo shifted, going from leaning against a wall to standing. I was blinded for a moment, and I couldn't breathe. I, I think everything was phasing through me. So I walked, and when the world returned, I was out of breath. Fudo crossed his arms, not looking at Momo. I then found myself just, like, looking at Sensei getting pummeled, and I felt like I needed to help. Then, then when I saw the villain about to touch him, I ran. Momo nodded her head at him. 
You did very well. Momo smiled at him. It's thanks to you that he's still alive. You did something heroic. Fudo blushed, grabbing his headphones and putting them on. T thank you, he said, before turning the music on and starting to pace. I saved a racer head. I was a hero. Fudo found a slight spring in his step as he walked. Maybe I can be a hero. He looked around at the rest of his class. I wonder if I do actually belong. Having finished his talk with the students of Class 1A, Tsukachi returned to the police office. He put the cruiser back into the garage and worked his way up the stairs to the third floor of the building. He liked taking the stairs instead of the elevator. It gave him time to think and helped make sure he was always in shape. When he opened the door for the third floor, he saw the small, three-person team under his command. He smiled to himself. Coming to the office and seeing people hard at work always put a slight smile on his face. Any news? He asked, hanging up his hat and coat, before sitting down at a desk that faced everyone. One of the officers, who was also a cat person, shook their head. No sir, nothing to report, Tamakawa stated firmly. The bell on his collar lightly jingled as they moved. Masayoshi Sensei is currently talking with the chief. Tsukachi put his hand on his chin. Again, this is the second time in the past few days. The detective muttered to himself. Sir, Tamakawa leaned in a bit, a quizzical expression on his face. Pay me no mind, just thinking out loud. Tsukachi turned to look out the window. I still don't trust him. You need to be more patient, Masayoshi-san, woof. The chief of police, Surigami stated, Masayoshi was sitting on the other side of their desk, his arms resting on the wooden surface, propping his head up. I don't want to be rude, sir, Masayoshi began, his eyes were shut and he was breathing deeply. But have you ever had to take quirk suppressants before? The detective leaned back, opening his eyes. They were bloodshot, and the pupils dilated. The chief shook his head. Woof, I can't say I ever have to, nor do I imagine I will. Masayoshi put his hands together and squeezed them tightly. I feel awful. It's only been a month, and they've needed to up the dosage several times. I understand there can be side effects, woof. But until your hero license comes through, you need to still take them. Masayoshi shifted in his chair, moving from leaning back to forward to back again. His hand moved to his forehead, which he rubbed vigorously. Any idea when my Japanese license will be cleared? I've been waiting a while. His voice was firm and dull. It sounded like he was holding something back in his throat. I would say one more week, woof. The chief sat back in his chair. Now, please get back to work. I'm sorry you have to go through this, but it is almost over, woof. Masayoshi stood up, clenching his fists. Thank you, sir. He took a pill out from his pocket and swallowed it. I cannot wait to not have to take this awful stuff anymore. Kyrie was laying down in bed. Her eyes were fixed on the ceiling, spending time counting the number of tiles, before trying to match her breathing with the gentle rhythm of the smoke alarm's light. She had spent quite a large amount of time going from hospital bed to hospital bed, so she figured out ways to help the time pass on even the most sleepless nights. In the room with her was Tsuyu, who laid on a mattress on the floor. Kyrie didn't want to go back to the hospital, but she needed more time to heal than would be allowed to spend in the school's infirmary. She turned her head to look at Tsuyu, who was reading. She hadn't asked her to spend the night, but the school wouldn't allow her to spend an entire night completely unsupervised, and Tsuyu volunteered. Kairi tried to move her right arm, but it didn't even budge. It was as if her nerves simply didn't want to respond to her inputs. Su, Kairi's voice was reluctant. Could you tell me what time it is? Sure, Kairi chan The frog girl responded, checking her phone. It's just after eight. Thank you, Su. Kairi turned their head to face her. You're a good, you're a good friend, Su. Don't mention it, I'm here to help. Suyu simply smiled at Kairi before returning to her book. Kairi moved her head back and stared up. You are not alone. Izuku's words echoed in her mind. Maybe I'm not, she thought to herself. Shoto pulled out his phone. It was 7 p.m. He sighed and put it back into his pocket. He didn't want to be on campus, but the school was requiring them to stay on account of the incident that had happened not several hours prior. A league of villains, Shoto thought to himself, sitting down on a nearby bench. He looked up at the darkening sky. He liked to take walks around the city every now and then, but, for today, campus had to do. He leaned back on the bench and slowly closed his eyes. He allowed his breathing to slow and his mind to drift slightly. No matter how much he tried to relax, he always felt tightly wound. His attempted tranquility was interrupted by his phone vibrating. He took it out of his pocket and reluctantly answered it. I've heard that you almost got severe frostbite today, a gruff and firm voice stated. Shoto was waiting for this call to happen, he'd been waiting for it all day. Shoto remained silent. He knew the one on the other end wasn't done talking yet. You know, boy, if you used fire, you wouldn't run into that issue. Shoto could feel his body tense at the word boy. He wanted to say something, to defend himself, but all he could manage was further silence. You need to use fire. Shoto, how can you expect to become the number one hero if you don't master both your mother's and my quirks? His father's voice grew louder. 
It was clear that he was trying to not shout into the phone. Then there was the sound of a door opening in the background. I need to go, boy. Think about what you've done. There was a click as the other person disconnected. Shoto leaned back again, his arms going limp. He wished his father would just stop calling him. Slowly, Shoto stood up from the bench, stretching his arms. I should get back to the dorms before it gets too late. As he started walking back, he almost bumped into another UA student. Watch where you're going. You damn class wanna prick. The voice was angry. And when Shoto looked back at who it belonged to, he saw a face twisted with hate. Don't look so fucking down, you're reminding me of someone worthless. The blonde student turned away from Shoto. Go back to your dorm. He yelled before putting his hands in his pockets and stomping away. Shoto looked behind him one more time at the other boy. That's right, he was in class 1 degrees Celsius. I remember seeing him storming out of the classroom shouting, just as loud now as he was then. Shoto shrugged him off. He had bigger things he needed to think about. Izuku sat in his dorm room. His eyes were glued to his phone as he read the initial coverage of what would be known as the USJ incident. He let out a sigh of relief when he read that none of the students were majorly harmed by the villains. He looked out the window, gazing off into the distance before going to his contacts and sending a text to Kyrie. A simple, I read what happened and wanted to make sure everything was okay. He scrolled through his contacts some more until he found Kaminari, whom he sent the same message to. He tried to not be unnecessarily concerned about their current condition, but he was still anxious about the entire ordeal. After around 10 minutes of no responses, Izuku realized he needed to stop looking at his phone and turned his attention to his laptop. Pulled up on screen were several articles about the mistreatment and life of quirkless people. They were all posted on a small editorial site that Izuku frequented. They had sources that checked out and spoke about things in a calm, level-headed manner, so Izuku trusted it. One of the more recent posts did catch Izuku's eye. Can a hero be quirkless? This question is something that society has discussed many times over, so I might as well throw my hat into the ring as well. Not so much to bring forth my own opinion, but to merely state the many different conclusions that have been drawn. One can argue for hours about opinion and morals, but at the end of the day, what matters is truth. I've spent the past few months talking with lawyers, doctors, pro-heroes when I can, teachers, and scientists to bring you the real answers to the question, can a hero be quirkless? My first stop was talking with pro-heroes. I, unfortunately, can't tell you who I spoke with, journalist integrity and all that, but I can say that I spoke with three small-time heroes and one medium-level one. All of them had basically the same response, yes. After asking for reasons why or to elaborate, three of them found themselves unable to fully explain why, how someone without a quirk could be a hero. One of the small-time heroes, however, did answer my follow-up. One who is powerful does not wake up and decide to be a hero, but one who decides to be a hero forges their own power. I do plan on releasing the entire interview I had with this person, but for now they would only allow that one line to be released. Oh well, my next stop was legally. I had an excellent discussion with a lawyer on the laws when it comes to pro-heroes and how you could become one. Unfortunately for the pro-heroes I spoke with, the law's answer was a no. According to Japan's pro-hero registration application, you must have a quirk in order to become a hero. This is a little-known fact, and I myself was surprised to learn it. As a quick tangent, I was interested to learn that there are many offices that offer hero license practice exams to those without quirks, even though there is no way for the people to ever take the exam. It's almost a form of exploitation and I'm surprised it's not illegal. That was the point where Izuku stopped reading. He opened a new tab and began a search. He was looking for local quirk practice exam places. It took him a few minutes before he found one that advertised exams for people without a quirk. People like him. The young Midoriya wanted to see the laws with his own eyes before he did anything rash. Before he could navigate to a page about the hero licensing exam, his phone buzzed. It was a message from Kaminari. Thanks for the message bro. And yeah, everything's alright over here. Kyrie is currently out cold still, but she should get better real quick. Everyone else is okay. Recovery girl does wonders. Izuku will read the message over again, making sure he read it correctly. He then started frantically typing out his response. What happened with Kyrie? From what I read all of the students were fine. Is she going to be okay? What happened? Izuku sent off his response quickly. He wanted to resume what he was doing but he couldn't drop focus from his friend, who apparently was hurt. So he sat there and waited, trying to prevent his mind from racing to conclusions. It was several days after the USJ incident at this point. Shigaraki was sitting in the bar, playing a video game where he threw darts at a picture of All Might. Kirajiri was happy to see him not mindlessly destroying things. But the shadowy man's hopes were soon dashed when a nearby laptop flicked on, and the voice of Shigaraki's mentor spoke from it. I'm still sorry what happened, Shigaraki Tamura. I never expected All Might to have that kind of power still. He should be growing weaker by the day. 
A controller flew across the room, smacking into the wall next to the laptop and shattering into pieces. Here Namu couldn't handle All Might at all. He lost without All Might even breaking a sweat. Shigaraki yelled at the laptop, his voice straining to stay at high volume. Please calm down, my dear Tamura. There is news straight from UA High itself. Unless it's a way to annihilate every last student, I don't care. Shigaraki turned to face away from the laptop, crossing his arms and pouting under the hand. The man on the other side of the laptop gave a hearty chuckle. About that, the UA Sports Fest is in a few weeks, and due to some connections, guess who is on the guest list? After hearing this Shigaraki turned back slowly. Is? Is it me? His face started to contort into a smile. Are you saying that I can? Interrupt the most important sporting event in Japan. Yes, my dear Shigaraki Tamura. The man on the laptop seemed overjoyed to give Shigaraki the news. The pale man clapped his hands happily. Can we find some new friends to bring? I want friends that don't lose to students. Of course, I think I know a place where you can get some very good friends. Later that same day at the police office, Sukachi was leaving for the night. The Grandmaster case was going nowhere quickly, and even he needed to take a break now and again. As he left the building to walk home, he saw one of the other officers standing outside, smoking. Jayodnai-san, was it? The detective asked the officer. Yeah, surprised you remember my name. We only spoke once at the USJ. The officer gruffly replied, taking a drag on the cigarette. I'm not one to forget names, the detective said, laughing lightly. How's the USJ case going? Jayodnai shrugged his shoulders, slowly moving the cigarette down to his side. There are reportedly almost 50 villains there, of which we caught 16. There's not a ton to go off of. Most of them aren't talking about who hired them or what that creature is. We still haven't found the damn thing anyways. The detective looked up at the officer. Really, I thought we could see where it landed with satellites. Couldn't we find it easily? Jayodnai shook his head, quickly taking another puff before speaking. Afraid not. We went to where it should have landed, but all we found was a crater. No footprints, no scent beyond the impact site, nothing. We don't even know how they jammed the damn phones. Surely one of them had a quirk to do it? Sukachi tilted his head. The answer seemed obvious to him, at least, but the officer clenched his fists. We've done search after search of the Quirk database, using contacts in the underworld even. There isn't a Quirk that lets you have a complete transmissions blackout, unless someone powerful is doing everything they can to keep their existence hidden, but that makes no sense. Suddenly the door to the police station flew open. A smiling Masayoshi walked outside and looked at the other two people. My response to you is, and I'm terribly sorry for overhearing, but nonetheless, if that is the only lead, then, by all means, pursue it. Masayoshi sang, clapping his hands to a rhythm that only he could hear. Some sort of crime lord in the same city as Yue. Color me intrigued. His head turned towards Tsukachi, which caused him to frown. But I'm already working a case. Darn. Just as quickly as he appeared, Masayoshi left down the street, a skip in his step. Once they both were sure he was out of earshot, Jayodnai slowly turned to face the detective. Who, the hell, was that guy? Jayodnai dropped his cigarette on the ground and crushed it with his shoe. He work with you. Sukachi crossed his arms and shook his head. Yeah, he does. But more importantly, he was lying. The detective slowly took out his journal while the officer went to speak. Sukachi raised his hand up, silencing the officer. He wasn't happy about this, not at all. Jayodnai san. At the mention of his name, the officer gave a little salute. Look into this. Criminal overlord for me. In relation to your own case, of course. Like it or not, Masayoshi had a point. The officer nodded his head. And also, tell me the moment it looks like Masayoshi is involved in any way. That man is hiding something. And I will determine what it is. Fizuku was sitting at a cafe with Kaminari and Hanta. It took a few days for the school to allow unsupervised outings from the students because of the USJ incident. Both Kaminari and Hanta were eager to leave the grounds. So Kairi is still not able to leave? Izuku asked, taking a sip of his hot chocolate. Kaminari shook his head, squeezing his cup. Her right leg is still acting up. She's walking with crutches. Kaminari was staring down at his cup. I did ask if she wanted to come, but she didn't want to. She just wanted to stay inside and heal. What happened to her? I thought the report said that the students were all fine. None of the villains gave us any more than a scrape or bruise. Hanta stated, what happened to Kairi? Well, she did that to herself. Hanta took a sip of his soda before continuing. I saw her quirk up close in the entrance exam. She saved an entire street of people by frying the circuits of multiple robots. But afterwards, she was a complete mess. Kaminori added. Her entire body was burned. It apparently took her a week to even move after that. Thankfully, she got better before class started. Izuku's eyes widened. Her quirk has that much blowback on herself. He asked, putting his cup down. Kaminari nodded while Hanta shrugged. 
She's gotten much better about not frying herself wherever she uses it. Hanta gave one of his happy-go-lucky grins. Everyone's quirk has issues. Hers are just very visible. When I was young, shooting out tape really hurt. Things change, people grow. Izuku put his hand to his chin and fell deep into thought. He was interrupted by Kaminari looking at his phone and getting up. Shoot, we need to get back to the dorms. The blonde said, putting some bills on the table to pay for the drinks. Wait, this early. Izuku stood and looked at the two others. Yeah, they have us on a short leash, Kaminari replied. But you're welcome to walk with us back to the gate. Izuku was happy to meet new people, and he liked Hanta. He was simple, but that wasn't a bad thing. What Izuku really wanted to do was speak with Kairi. He figured that she was feeling isolated or lonely. However, after speaking with the guys that feeling went away, Kairi was in good hands. The three boys talked about their classes and their lives outside of school as they walked. They soon reached the gates of Yue. Welp, this is as far as you can go, Izuku. You're always a cool dude to chat with. Kaminari shook his hand before turning to walk through the threshold. Hanta simply waved at him as his goodbye. Izuku turned around to walk back to his own campus when he slammed directly into someone. He took a step back and rubbed his face. I am sorry, he said, lightly bowing to whomever he ran into. No, don't apologize, it was my fault. I was distracted, the other said. Izuku raised his head and saw who it was. They had half red hair, half white hair, with a large burn on their left side. For a moment their eyes gazed into each other's, and Izuku saw something familiar. The moment was broken when Shoto gave his own small bow before going to walk into Yue. Izuku reached out his hand, grabbing the boy's shoulder. Wait, Todoroki-san, I, I have. Izuku didn't want to seem creepy, but he needed to ask Shoto something. The other boy shrugged his shoulder, pushing Izuku's hand off. What do you want? Shoto asked, turning his head slightly. His tone was that of annoyance. Are you being bullied? Izuku blurted without really thinking. Shoto froze, not expecting someone to just ask something like that. Izuku stood there for a moment, waiting for him to respond. After a minute, Izuku just decided to continue. My name is Midoriya Izuku, and I saw it in your eyes. It was hiding, way in the back. I recognize it because I remember seeing it in my own eyes every day in the mirror. Shoto tensed. This person, this, stranger had seen his heart by simply looking at his eyes. He still kept his back turned. Why are you telling me this? I don't know you. Izuku paused for a moment, picking his words carefully. This world loves to take and remind you of what it's taken. He shifted on his feet. My entire life after I was seven was filled with being told I was worthless. I would have been consumed by despair and fallen into nothing if someone didn't save me. Thankfully, I had someone to turn to, and they allowed me to. Are you going to save me? Asked Shoto. His voice was firm and annoyed. You're talking a lot, but that doesn't mean anything unless you act. I, uh, I mean, there's no point in asking if you're not going to help. Shoto took a deep breath and resumed walking away. For my entire life until high school. I was shoved into a corner by someone else, forced to feel a certain way because of someone else. Shoto stopped walking. He felt compelled to listen to what the boy had to say, to at least acknowledge the passion. Izuku kept talking. He wanted to get through to Shoto. He didn't want that hidden pain to exist in anyone. I saw that same pain in your eyes, and I owe it to my past self to make sure no one feels like that. He always wished to become a hero, and this wasn't a job for the Grand Master. For me, that pain is in the past, but for you, it looks too recent. So this was his act of heroism. Please, Todoroki-san, he reached out his heart to Shoto. Can we talk? I want to help you. Shoto couldn't move. He glanced back at Izuku. And even though a small, punk kid was looking back, he could feel the true passion to help emanating from them. It doesn't benefit you to help me, so why are you offering? I was perfectly fine on my own, and my future is determined. I don't mean any disrespect, but please, stop talking to me. The walls Shoto put up around himself hardened, shutting out everything. Were you the one that determined it? Izuku asked, and Shoto closed his eyes. I asked you to stop talking. Shoto turned to face Izuku. Izuku could plainly see the scowl on Shoto's face. It hurt him to see someone in pain slapping away help, but he had one final idea. Fine, I'll stop talking, but one more question. I want you to answer it. Izuku begged. No guarantees. Shoto crossed his arms. Why do you want to be a hero? Izuku's question was simple, but when Shoto went to answer it he found himself at a loss. He'd remembered the talks he'd have with his father about being a hero. To him telling, to him telling his mother about how he wanted to be like All Might. He'd kept the actions of his father secret from the world for so long. And for years no one suspected anything. Even when his mother attacked, there was a lie that it was unprovoked. Everyone believed it. No one even suspected for a second that the number two pro hero could do wrong. Endeavor was a hero built on lies and fear. So why did Shoto want to be a hero? Shoto spoke softly. I want to be the type of hero that doesn't fight for admiration or fame. I want to help people for the sake of doing so. 
someone who treats all situations with kindness. He uncrossed his arms. That answer your question? Izuku nodded his head. Want to know why I want to be a hero? Izuku asked. Shoto shook his head no, but Izuku just ignored that. I want to show people that being a hero doesn't have to do with being strong, or fast, or powerful. I want to show people that being a hero, a true hero, just takes strength of character. I saw you, a stranger, in pain and I couldn't stand for it. I was reminded of one of All Might's old quotes. A flash of recollection crossed Shoto's face. Butting your nose in is one of the principal properties of being a hero. Shoto knew that line. It wasn't exactly an obscure one, but not as talked about as some of his others. Shoto took a step towards Izuku. What if I refuse your help? What if I turn my back and run? Izuku gently smiled. I'd remember you, and hope that you'd get better. You're a friend of a friend. It's not my job to make sure you're doing alright, but as a hero wannabe, I can't leave you here on your own without at least offering. Izuku reached out his hand. So, Todoroki-san, what do you say? Shoto kept his face expressionless at all times. That's something he did after the accident with his mother. It was almost a condition he had, but right now, he could feel something in him cracking. Someone recognized his trouble and was offering to help. He quickly grabbed a tissue from the bunch he always carries around and wrote on it. If you're serious about helping me, this is my number. His hand was outstretched, holding out the tissue to Izuku. Izuku's eyes flicked from the tissue to Shoto's face. It was expressionless, but his eyes held something new. A faint glimmer of hope. You better be serious, Midoriya Khan. Izuku grabbed the tissue and put it in his pocket before laughing nervously and scratching the back of his head. I very much am. Shoto simply nodded at him, turned, and walked away. Izuku took out the tissue, looked at the number on it, and smiled to himself. What did I just get myself into? Shoto wondered as he finally got away. When Kaminari and Hanta got back to the dorm, almost everyone was buzzing around in the common area. Most of the people were talking about the upcoming sports fest. Kaminari plopped himself down on one of the couches, joining a conversation between Mina and Ijiro. Geez, I can't believe the school just drops the fact that Sports Fest is coming up on us. Mina had her arms and legs crossed and was leaning back on a couch. It feels unfair that we only get two weeks to train after they tell us. Ijiro leaned in and smashed his hands together. Yeah, it also sucks we can't tell anyone about it. The announcement isn't until next week. Ijiro looked towards Kaminari. Don't you wish you could tell people that you're gonna be on national television? Kaminari looked at his hand. I guess so. He said softly, small sparks arcing in his palm. I want to be excited for it. I dreamed of it for years, but I'm doubting myself, you know. He looked towards his friends for confirmation. Sorry man, I don't get it. Ajiro replied. I'm not on the same page either. Mina began. Sports Fest is where you can show the world who you are and what you can do. Aizawa Sensei even said that it's a great scouting opportunity. Yeah man, I'm nervous too, but doubt isn't what's on my mind. Kaminari looked between his two friends and weakly smiled. You guys have unique quirks though. Acid secretion and hardening. Those are cool and useful. How am I supposed to show myself off while Kairi is in the same class? Ijiro put his hand on Kaminari's shoulder. Comparing yourself to others isn't manly. You should embrace who you are instead of some idea of what you can never be. Crimson Riot said that, and I think it's really good advice. Ijiro gave him a thumbs up. So get out there and be the best you that you can be. It's the manly thing to do. Mina joined Ijiro in his thumbs up. Yeah, come on, Kaminari-kun. No need to feel down. You got into class 1a for a reason. Kaminari glanced between the floor and their smiles. Yeah, I guess I did. He said, his smile returning. I guess there was a reason. The night after Izuku spoke with Shoto, he found himself outside on a street. He was in full Grandmaster attire, and his eyes were gazing into a hero license exam training building. He had read up on this place, it wasn't shady, except for the fact that they sold lies to quirkless people. Izuku clenched his fists, determined to make it clear that exploitation wasn't okay. He stepped towards the front door when he heard footsteps behind him. He didn't need to turn around, his goggles still allowed him to see behind himself. There were three people behind him. They all looked worse for wear, clothing battered, faces limp with some form of drug, and stances shaky and uneven. It only took a few moments before Izuku smelled the alcohol on them. At first he thought they were just wondering what someone his age was doing here, but they didn't leave. They slowly got closer to him. You look like some kinder rich kid, the tallest of them said. His voice was squeaky and slurred. He was wearing a dark hoodie that looked threadbare. I wonder if this rich kid got any money on him. Another of them asked. He was only a few inches taller than Izuku, and was round in shape. His voice was high-pitched and misarticulated. Boy, rich kid, you got money on ya. The final of them asked. He was of medium build, with long, grimy red hair. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a knife. We just want a bit, enough for another round. Izuku could sense the most malice from this one. Their eyes staring directly at the back of his head. 
It seemed like he didn't need to blink, just staring blankly at the back of Izuku's head. I don't have money, Izuku said, the voice changer making his voice deep and computerized. Two of the guys took a step back when they heard it, but the redhead kept walking, slowly getting closer. Though, I don't believe you. Turn around and empty your pockets, rich kid, the man with the knife demanded. Izuku's mind started to feel the pressure of the situation. He knew no hero would be coming this way for another hour or so, and police didn't patrol here at this time either. This was the perfect moment to leave his message. But apparently this was also the perfect moment to get robbed. Izuku breathed in and out deeply, allowing his mind to relax. The Grandmaster opened his eyes, stating three simple words. Open the game. The knife-wielding thug rushed the Grandmaster, who slapped their arm away before sweeping their legs. They fell to the floor with a soft thud. The rounded one lunged at the Grandmaster, who jumped up and grabbed the lip of the window's frame. The thug smacked into the window while the Grandmaster brought his foot down onto their head, knocking them out. He looked at the final one, walking over the two thugs on the ground and glaring at the third. Your move, he stated, getting into an offensive stance. I bet you think you're cool, with your quirk and money and shit. The thug reached into their hoodie pocket, pulling out a syringe. Well fuck you. In a swift motion, the thug removed the cap from the needle and stabbed themselves in the neck. They fell to the floor, convulsing and shaking. Just as quickly as their movement started, they stopped. Slowly, they pushed themselves up, rising to full height. And my quirk was called useless. The Grandmaster could see the skin under their clothing shift and bubble. I could change the texture of my skin. Their hoodie started to expand, as something was pressing on it from underneath. They arched their back, the hoodie bursting into a shower of cloth scraps. Their bare skin expanded and shifted, some parts solidifying, others softening. It looked like clay being molded by someone who didn't have much skill. People like you, should just die. Bakugu Katsuki was currently restless. He rolled side to side in his bed, his mind unable to settle on anything. It wasn't particularly late at night, around 10pm, but the fact that he had nothing to do but think pissed him off. He sat up, putting his feet on the floor with a thud. He stared at the wall to his dorm room. Sure, he got into UA, but he wasn't in either of the hero courses. He was in class 1 degrees Celsius, a general studies course. Thinking about that fact made his blood boil. He got the highest marks on the physical exam. Not to mention that his teachers surely told Yue the potential he had. He had about two weeks to finalize a solid plan. That's when the sports fest would take place and he was sure as hell going to show everyone that he had what it took to be in a hero course. Bakugu stood up fully, stretching his back. He moved to his desk and plopped himself down into it, scowling. He didn't want to do this, but he felt backed into a corner. Someone like him couldn't lose. He opened a drawer to his desk, and buried under all of his binders for various classes sat a small five-page pamphlet. The title of it was childish, but Bakugu remembered how useful its contents were. Strategies for Kakin was scrawled on the front in crayon. Bakugu sneered at it, ripping it open. He hated that worthless, green-haired boy, but he recognized that they were smart. Stupid, quirkless Deku. He muttered under his breath before beginning to read the pamphlet for the second time in his life. The Grandmaster had spent years studying quirks, not in an academic capacity, but in a combat logistics one. Kadachi had shown him videos of quirks he had never seen before, instructing him to figure out their abilities and strategize a way to defeat them. Since he didn't have a quirk of his own, he needed to bolster his intelligence and speed any way he could. Even though he had only just witnessed the quirk's use, the Grandmaster had already figured several things. One, the quirk had the ability to change the material that the user's skin was made of. Two, the quirk could expand or shrink their skin as well, which is what caused their hoodie to burst. Three, they injected themselves with something that most likely made their quirk stronger. Taking all of these facts into account, he remembered something that he had read online. The quirk enhancement drug, trigger, can greatly improve one's own quirk for a limited time. However, usage of Trigger was made illegal after the Queen Bee incident, on account of the fact that Trigger makes one aggressive and angry regardless of the base personality of the individual, not to mention the extreme damage that those under the influence of the drug have caused. The Grandmaster examined their surroundings. Behind them were several shops, including the Hero Exam Practice Building. Across the street were more shops. There was the occasional alleyway dotted between the stores. The area was quite open, but he was currently backed into a wall. He needed space, he needed room to move. He could feel his breath picking up as his heart beat faster. His eyes were darting around streetlights, road guardrails, and trash cans were all that he had access to. The mass of flesh started to move towards him, but everything seemed to move to slow motion as the Grandmaster's mind started to race for a solution. You need to learn to think faster, practice tying your breathing to your thinking. That might help you visualize how fast you need to be moving. Kadach's words echoed in his head. The Grandmaster's eyes continued to flip from object to object until he burst back into motion. He had found his play. Bakugu slammed his fists into his desk. 
he had read and reread the pamphlet. And every time he did, he got frustrated. Even all those years ago, Izuku had figured him out to a T outlining his quirks flaws and major strengths. Bakugu felt studied like a lab rat. He scowled again, the green squirt was right. And he hated that more than anything right now. Quirkless Deku, he muttered under his breath. How can you evaluate quirks so well even though you don't have one? The Grandmaster dived under the stranger's legs, rolling back onto his feet on the other side. After evaluating multiple options this one was best. The thug wasn't currently reshaping their legs while having a wide stance. They then turned, twisting their back unnaturally. The sound of their spine cracking reverberated in the street. A guttural growl escaped their mouth, the ground shaking slightly from the force of it. Don't move, squirt. The thug yelled, slamming their foot into the ground, causing it to crack. The grandmaster took a step back, remaining wary of their opponent. Why don't you catch me then? He provoked before dashing away, running for the nearest alleyway. Once inside, he evaluated it. There were trash cans scattered everywhere, and he needed to work quickly. The thuds of heavy footsteps approached him, each footfall causing the ground to tremble. The thugs' movements were slower than usual. They had hardened their skin, making it more durable and sharp as well. However, this also made them much heavier, and they weren't used to moving around in this form. When they finally reached the alleyway, the Grandmaster was sitting down on a broken chair several meters away from the entrance. The thug almost smiled when he saw the dead end at the back of the alleyway. You took your time getting here. Must not be used to playing with a clock. The Grandmaster's voice was wavering. The thug rushed forwards with a rage deep in their eyes. Their charge was interrupted by their foot getting caught on something. A moldy rope was strung and tied between two trash cans. The thug swiftly lost balance and began to fall. On the ground, right where their head would land, was a broken cinder block. After a quick moment of pain, the thug stopped moving, and the Grandmaster got up and walked to their side. Amazing what people throw away. He felt proud of himself, making that trap as quickly as he did. He hadn't quite been sure he got the height correct, but it was good enough. The Grandmaster stretched. He could still feel his heart beating out of his chest. He walked over and leaned against the nearby wall of the alleyway, removing his goggles and rubbing his eyes. He had been wearing them since he changed clothing, and they hurt his eyes if he wore them for too long. He pushed himself off of the wall and returned to the entrance of the alleyway. He put the goggles in his pocket before something struck him from behind hitting his left shoulder and sending him into the air. It was only for a second or two, but he could feel a pain in his left arm as he hit the ground. He flipped over, managing to ignore the pain for now. The thug was walking near him, their skin bubbling again, but this time popping with large bursts of air being blown out. In their hands was the cinder block, with a small crimson stain on it. The thug looked like they wanted to speak, but the only thing they could manage was a snarl. Their body was bloated. Their teeth were jagged and puncturing their lips, and their arms bulged with muscles. It looked like their skin was tightly stretched over their body. The drug must be in full effect. I need to find a way to immobilize them. The Grandmaster's eyes moved quickly, taking in as much information as he could. He already had a decent mental map of the area, so he should be able to find a way out, a way to survive. He scrambled backwards on the ground, examining the light posts, the street, the cinder block, everything. His eyes settled on the monstrosity before him. His heart rate increased, he could feel the world around him starting to blur. Izuku was scared of dying. Ikioi woke up in a cold sweat. He could feel his legs shaking. He quickly threw aside the sheet covering him, and there they were, his unmoving legs. He sat up and reached down to put a hand on them. They weren't shaking, but he needed the touch to confirm it. His breathing was labored and heavy. He ran his hands through his hair, pulling on it slightly. He tried to steady his breathing, counting down from ten as he did it. His wheelchair sat beside him, with an easy reach next to his bed. He reached out and put a hand on it. Feeling the cold metal on his fingers reminded him of the present. The past is the past, he thought to himself, putting his hand on his stomach. Images of a burning car flashed in his mind. All the efforts he made to steady his breathing evaporated. As the smell of gasoline hit his nose, he could feel the heat on his skin, could smell the burning flesh and remember the pain. He couldn't hold it anymore. He grabbed a bucket he kept near his bed and hurled into it. When he finished, he sat there, his mind floating. He leaned himself against the wall, gazing out the window into the night. The past is the past, he reassured himself. His eyes slowly moved back to his wheelchair. So much effort and training gone to waste. So many precious moments squandered. He shook his head, slapping his face. No, I will become a pro hero. As long as this passion burns inside me, I will not stop. He examined the chair again. I need to talk to the support division because, after all, a sudden flashback struck him, and he could feel his heart melt as he heard her voice again. A hero overcomes, no matter what. Nothing holds them back, not even themselves. Ikioi squeezed the shirt he was wearing in a tight fist. I love you, mom. Ikioi muttered, tears rolling down his cheeks. Your dream lives on in me. 
In many ways, death was the ultimate motivator. The idea that once you're gone, that's it, inspires people to push beyond what they would have normally done. What will you be remembered by after death, and does it matter? What change will you have caused? A great many people get caught up in the idea that one person is all it takes to change the world. But this is not true. There are too many people alive for just one to make a difference. However, this does not mean that one should not try. All it takes is one person to change another. And this cycle will continue, propagating out to everyone on Earth. Izuku hadn't changed anyone yet. He couldn't die now. Just one. His body jumped off the ground. A newfound speed in him. I only need to change one. He charged the thug who brought down the cinder block. I can't stop now. I haven't even started. He slammed his left foot into the ground, kicking off to suddenly shift to the right. The block hit the ground with a crack, and Izuku caught himself with his hands, sliding on the rough asphalt. I am the Grandmaster, and I will change this world. He firmly stated, not to the thug, not to the world, but to himself. The thug was slowly moving, returning to their standing position. The muscles in the Grandmaster's legs tensed as he shot towards the thug. His body was screaming at him to slow down. There were stories, back before quirks, of normal people doing extraordinary things. Children lifted cars, people sprinted for hours without a break, and people ignored great pain to save others. There were no quirks then, and so here stood the Grandmaster, in a world that told him he was powerless. The adrenaline coursed through the Grandmaster's system, thrusting him forwards. His mind clouded with his ultimate objective. He slammed into the thug, the smacking sound echoing throughout the street. The Grandmaster moved his arms, grabbing the thug's rough, bubbling skin. He firmly held them, before propelling himself upwards. His hands were bleeding, cut by the thug's skin. Izuku landed on their shoulders, his legs wrapping around their neck. You never altered above your neck. He screamed, tightening his grip. The thug's arms moved up to grab the Grandmaster's legs. He pulled his arm back and punched the thug's arm. He could feel the impact shake his shoulders, but he did it again. Then again, and again, the thug's face started to turn blue. Their hands went from trying to grab him to clawing at him. The thug swayed back and forth, their legs giving out. The Grandmaster held tightly, but flipped off of them just before they hit the ground with a thud. He had barely landed on his feet. He turned, looking down at his opponent. He took the goggles out of his pocket and put them back on. Checkmate. The Grandmaster was breathing heavily, battered from the fight but victorious. Kyrie lay in bed, unable to sleep again. She focused on the slow and gentle movement of her breathing. Her attention turned to her phone resting beside her. Since she had been given the okay for going outside, she wanted to contact Izuku to talk to him. They hadn't really talked since their initial encounter, but she wished that wasn't the case. She reached out and grabbed her phone, sending over a request to meet after school sometime. She put her phone down and stared at the ceiling, waiting for sleep to take her away. It took the Grandmaster around 10 minutes to get the scene looking like how he wanted. He positioned the bodies of the thugs on a nearby streetlight, tying them all up. He wrote on the windows of the exam place in big, bold letters, Danger. Will exploit quirkless. He stuck a small letter to the door as well. He smiled at his job well done. He started to walk back to the dorm, ducking into a nearby alleyway to change back to his punk clothing. As he took off his gloves, he noticed all of the cuts on his hands. His legs, left arm, and right hand started to ache as well. It seemed like he had pushed himself too hard in that fight and was suffering the consequences. Thankfully, his hoodie was slightly too big for him so almost no skin on his hands would be visible. It shouldn't take more than a week for these wounds to heal, and that should be all the time he needed. Sukachi got a call at around midnight. He rolled over, facing the other side of his bed. He had just managed to fall asleep an hour or so ago. He squinted as he read the text on the phone. He answered it, bringing it to his ear. Speak, the detective stated groggily. His eyes half open, Sukachi san There has just been another Grandmaster scene. The police officer on the other end spoke quickly, knowing the detective could fall back asleep if not given the news. The officer heard the sound of cloth ruffling before a voice came through. I'm headed out now, send me the address. The detective didn't have time to fully tuck in his shirt before he left, dashing to his car. When he arrived on scene Masayoshi was already there, along with one other officer on the task force. They were going about taking photos while Masayoshi waited. There was another police car there, with three people sitting in the back of it. Any findings, Masayoshi-san? Sukachi asked, his eyes running over the scene. The other detective shook his head. Not yet. I'm waiting for the photographer to be done before I dare to disturb the scene. He pointed to the police car. Those three were found on the scene, tied to the light here. Only two of them are conscious, so you might want to question them. Sukachi nodded, turning to walk towards the car before hesitating. Why didn't you question them? A small chuckle rose from Masayoshi. I want to read the letter first. He pointed to the envelope taped to the door. I'm sure it might shed some light on who these people are. 
When Sakachi reached the police cruiser, he calmly put himself in the front seat and turned to face the other three people. My name is Sukachi, and I'm a detective. You're not being charged with anything. Bloody hell we're not. We didn't do nothing wrong. The red-headed one interrupted. He had a fire in his eyes. Please calm down, sir. Sukachi held out his hand. I don't know why you three were put in the back, but I imagine there is a reason. Please though, tell me what happened. You bet we will. We were minding our business when this kid was standing in front of that store. We asked him what he was doing, and he jumped us. Sukachi jotted down some things in his notes. All right, I believe you. The detective looked up at the three. Well, except for him jumping you. I have a knack for discerning the truth. What really happened? I'm telling ya, that's what happened. Sukachi glared at the redhead. My quirk, truth, allows me to tell when someone is lying to me. Please, just tell me what happened. The redhead glared back at the detective, before crossing his arms and looking away. I have rights. He responded coldly and firmly. Sukachi rolled his eyes and left the cruiser. Masayoshi was just taking the envelope off of the door and opening it. His eyes quickly scanned the contents. My friend, you might want to have a look at this. This is some interesting reading. Masayoshi handed the letter to Tsukachi, who promptly read it as well. The idea of someone who is without a quirk obtaining a hero license, to most people, is absurd. The idea of someone without a quirk on the streets, risking their lives, fighting criminals, is seen as a danger. This cannot be more incorrect. There are many pro heroes who walk the streets without combat-related quirks, and no one bats an eye to this. There are pro heroes who rescue people from dangerous situations without a quirk that can put out fires, protect themselves or others, or even give more strength or mobility. So why are those without a quirk disallowed from helping, from risking their life to save the lives of others? A hero license is not a sign of a heroic spirit, but it is more akin to a permit to publicly use one's quirk. This is easily demonstrated by the fact that over 65% of people with a hero license do no form of heroic deed. This information is publicly available on the Hero Licensing Agency's website, which brings me nicely to the licensing exam. This foundation the letter was attached to as a tutor for the exam. It, among several others listed in the footnotes, offered its services to everyone, including those who don't have a quirk. However, the exam would instantly turn away anyone without a quirk. These institutions are scamming those whom society already deemed less fortunate, and I think this should be brought to light. This is my first real move of the game, and I am curious to see what the rebuttal is. I am the Grandmaster, and I will bring to light the wrongs of society. Sukachi read and reread the letter. His eyes skimmed it, getting all the detail he could. It was typed and printed on average-sized printer paper. There were no markings on the paper, and it was neatly folded to fit in the envelope. The front of the envelope was blank, and the back was sealed. The detective flipped the page over. The only thing on the other side was a list of addresses, most likely to other businesses that were scamming people. Sukachi carefully folded the letter back up, placing it in the envelope. Take this to the lab, officer. Make sure it stays pristine. I want full analysis of the materials, and a copy of it on my desk by tomorrow morning. The officer grabbed the envelope, lightly bound to the detective, and walked over to the patrol car. Sukachi turned towards Masayoshi. What's your take on it? The other detective shook his head and shrugged his shoulders. I'm not so sure. The prose seemed deliberate, careful. I felt the same way. Sukachi raised his gloved hand to his chin. I think we should regroup on this tomorrow morning. Once the lab results from the scene and the letter get back, Masayoshi nodded, smiling. Quite right. I am ever so exhausted right now. He pointed to the cruiser. And what of them? Sukachi turned to face the trio. Let's get a statement from the two who are awake and put the third into protective custody. I'm still not sure why they were tied up, but I do wonder why that one is unconscious. The least we can do is protect him for now. A cold wind blew through the street as the detectives walked over to the cruiser. Sukachi looked up at the sky, raising his hand to block the light from the lamp he was standing under. There were no stars. The sky colored a dark blue by the lights surrounding them. Several miles away, sitting in a dark dorm room and staring out the window, was Izuku. Overhead of them both was the moon, its shining light the only thing able to pierce the dark sky. Sukachi turned his eyes back ahead, while Izuku kept looking at the moon. I need to make sure justice is upheld, they both thought to themselves. 